Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to UNESCO's first celebration of International Women's Day. Uh, we've taken this opportunity to organize a conference on a very important subject, uh, tapping into the unlocked potential of women in emergencies. I'm very happy that we were able to get uh, speakers from UNHCR, CORDAID, UNSDR, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and I'm happy to see many new faces at UNESCO IG for this event. Um, today, we have two of our MSc students um, who will take over and moderate the entire show. Um, but for now, I would like to welcome our rector and uh, uh, Andras Solejnaj and our business director, Greet Fink, to the stage to open. Excellencies, dear colleagues from the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen, this is indeed a great honor to welcome you here at UNESCO IHE at this very special occasion. A conference which is devoted to a, a subject that is of key importance. For those of you, very briefly, who may not be familiar with what this institute is doing, let me just run through very briefly on a few uh, slides that may give you an idea and an introduction to uh, an institute that is now nearly 60 years old, but over the past uh, 10 years is a part of UNESCO. When the Dutch government has contributed uh, it to UNESCO with a view towards uh, strengthening international education. Basically, the mandate uh, of the institute is no less than to train the next generation of water leaders for the benefit of developing countries and uh, countries in uh, transition. So what we are, uh, we are the, as I mentioned yesterday to my colleagues from the UN uh, Secretariat for uh, Disaster Reduction, uh, is that uh, our institute is the biggest graduate school in the world in water which is not a big deal because there is only one, so that's what we are. <laughs> the, the institute uh, has a huge network of alumni, some 15,000 that has uh, graduated over the past uh, years uh, here in, in Delft. 95% of our students are coming from the uh, developing countries, and perhaps uh, a world record what the institute has is that there's literally no brain drain. 98% of our students are going back to their country of origin. We have a, an alumni tracking system whereby we try to see what happens uh, to the graduate. And what is even more interesting that 20 years after graduation, 80% of the students are still in the profession, which is, which is again a, a very rare thing. And of course we are uh, very proud of, 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 of the fact that we have five active ministers of our, uh, of our former graduates. Uh, one of them graduated a few years back and uh, we had to sort of help him a little bit that, you know, get your act together and finish the thesis. And a month later I had to call him your excellency because he became uh, a minister of a, a, a major country. So we have to be very careful here, the uh, professors, how, how we behave. The core activities of the institute cover a, a quite a wide uh, range uh, from formal training, education programs, master of science programs, covering all sorts of, of water, whether you talk about sanitary engineering, you talk about water supply, you talk about disaster risk management, you talk about climate change, hydroinformatics, this is the birthplace of hydroinformatics, all the way up to capacity development and capacity building by a series of short uh, courses, tailored courses, all aiming at improving the situation in the developing uh, countries. You may know, ladies and gentlemen, as we speak, uh, a, a, a major debate is going on in the United Nations uh, chambers to define the post-2015 development goals. Goals that will replace the Millennium Development Goals, which we, have, we will not reach in the two critical fields of water supply uh, and, and sanitation. On the water supply goal, we are on track. So probably by the end of next year, the goal to halve the number of those human beings who have no access to safe drinking water will be achieved. 
we are going down from 1.4 billion to 708 million still not being uh, supplied with adequate uh, drinking water. But what is much worse is the sanitation situation, where at the beginning of the century we had 2.6 billion, 2.4 uh, billion human beings not having uh, access to improved sanitation. And today we have 2.6. So instead of improving the situation, the situation is even worse. So that's an area where we have to, uh, to concentrate. This debate is going on. This WASH agenda will continue, likely, uh, under the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, amongst which uh, one uh, will be devoted to the subject of what we are going to discuss today. This is not a tsunami. This is a flood, a, f a, a flood uh, that is overtopping uh, a, a, a dike. Perhaps not many of you are uh, familiar with uh, how important, what an important role water disasters play amongst all the disasters Today we will hear about it in, in detail. A huge majority uh, of, of, of natural disasters is coming through hydro, met, or other flood-related disasters or drought-related disasters. There are more people killed by these than by any other. And something is happening over the, uh, the hydrological uh, cycle. It seems like the hydrological cycle is accelerating, thereby giving yield to uh, the, the, an increased probability of extremes. Likely we will have more floods, very likely, to keep the balance at work, continuity at work, we will have more droughts, both in space and time. So if the question is, will we have more natural disasters related to water in stock in the future, the answer, unfortunately, is yes, we will. And we have to prepare ourselves to that. On top of the, 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 the flood situation, we have a great number of man-made conflicts. And I have to emphasize that these are man-made conflicts not women made uh, conflicts. <laughs> so uh, language, <laughs> but language reflects to the reality. We talk about wars, we talk about skirmishes, we talk about ethnic issues, we talk about uh, conflicts over water. Darfur was a starting point and there are many, uh, many other issues. Where at the suffering end, men also, but more, uh, more than that, uh, women, children and families and women who are there to help the family survive in terrible situations, be it a natural disaster or a man-made disaster. This is the subject what uh, uh, we will uh, discuss this afternoon, just the day before the International Women's Day. And I'm very, very happy to have a, 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 a core of distinguished speakers uh, from the UN uh, system and also from the NGO community. And I hope we will have a, a very successful uh, and fruitful uh, debate today that may even come up with a number of recommendations which we could channel into the process that will lead to the seventh World Water Forum to be held in, uh, in, uh, in Korea, in Daegu. Two of us are standing here, which also reflects the, uh, the, uh, uh, the balance uh, what we are seeking at the Institute. Hreit, Hreit Fink, uh, is the business director, as she was introduced. I'm the rector, we have the third one, uh, a third uh, a person, uh, Stefan Nullenbrook, who is the uh, Vice Rector for Academic Affairs. So for us at this institute, it is equally important that our business and our academic level go hand in hand, because we are, as you know, entirely extra budgetary. Here comes a commercial break, so if you'd like to establish a scholarship fund, please don't hesitate, <laughs> come to, uh, st uh, to uh, create, to perhaps to help ladies coming to learn here from Africa and from other places, right? Yes. Thank you, Andras. Um, well, the topic of today is, of course, uh, tapping into the unlocked potential of women during emergencies or disaster risk relief operations. Um, currently, there are up to 80% of um, the displaced persons worldwide are women and children, which are internal refugees or you know, refugees to, to, that live outside their country. Uh, the number of conflicts, as we shown on the map, increases, and a lot of those conflicts sometimes are related to water as well. Uh, humanitarian emergencies caused by war or natural disasters have a 
higher impacts on women and their families than um, mostly on men. As this existing gender inequality uh, more or less increases, um, and there are also changes in gender roles. Sometimes it can be slightly positive, but most of the time women get extra burden. Um, the humanitarian response, therefore, should be based on awareness of gender relations. Um, that's simply said, you know, you can say this, but how are you going to do that? So I want to tell you an anecdote. I started my career working for UNHCR in the Sudan in 1984, during the big famine and crisis in Ethiopia and Eritrea. And I was in charge of primary education and um, trying to get uh, teachers trained to run the schools in the refugee camps. Um, there were major disasters going on. cholera, meningitis, lack of drinking water, and in the raining season, many camps got flooded. But there was one camp that actually, there were no major disasters going on. It was completely well organized. You know, uh, it was not flooded during the rainy season. And this camp was run by an old army col colonel out of Canada who served a, a long time in the uni field, etc. When you would see the guy, he looked like a gorilla. You know, he had arms like this, was always sporting, even in the refugee camp. And at first glance, of course, the person, at first glance, you would say, well, that probably is the most gender blind person you ever would meet. But that wasn't the case, because he managed, at first glance, to get women involved in the planning of sanitation and drinking water facilities in the camp. He also got women that far that they instructed the men to dig canals around the tents, because the women didn't want to sit in a wet tent every evening and sleep there with their children. So when I met the field officer of UNHCR, I said, how did you manage? You know, you have hardly any diseases in this camp. Uh, people are queuing up for the emergency feeding center. They come for their vaccinations, all the things that uh, went completely wrong in the beginning in the other camps. And uh, so I thought it was due to his army experience, but that was not the case. He told me, I'm from a farming family in Canada. And in my farming family, women run the show in the household. So. I noticed quite quickly that all the refugees we have here are also from an agricultural background. So it made sense to me to talk to the NGOs and invite the women to discuss what should be needed in the camp with regards to drinking water, with regards to the food distribution, health, education, etc. And I said, that's how I started planning this camp. So I think by myself, oh my goodness, there I stand, just out of university, done with my degree in uh, human geography and, and uh, an extra course in gender, you know, <laughs> with all those diplomas in my pocket, you know, and not knowing what to do, and this guy knows what to do because he, he follows his, his instinct, he follows the way people interact with each other. And that was a big lesson, I think, because there are no statistical relations between conflicts or gender or uh, emergencies, but they're all interlinked because they have a huge effect on each other. And I think when many of us, you know, listen to the, the target group we are working with or are going to work with, I think then many problems can be solved very easily. You don't have to be a gender expert to know who is in charge of what in a family. You can just ask, and I think that's a big lesson I learned by surfing for UNHCR, uh, by talking to people, sitting down with people, and see what the solution would be or could be. And I think by not seeing women every time as a passive victim, but putting women in a leadership position, they are often in lead of their household affairs. They often have a specific role when it comes to water provision, in their family, and when we honor that role, I think a lot of problems could be solved with proper planning and more or less taking note of that. Um, as UNESCO IHC, we are also proud to tell you that we are training, I think, well, we are the only water education institute, but the number of females trained here 
to become a water expert is about 36%, which is extremely high when you compare it to comparable institutions worldwide. The number of females among our PhD students is about 40%, which is also extremely high. So there is a lot of hope for good specialists in the future that can help out in emergencies. Thank you. I don't know whether there are any questions at this moment. No, we the facilitator. Then we leave it to you. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the conference today. And uh, we will be taking you through the sessions and hope that we'll be able to have a fruitful discussion today that, like the rector says, will lead to uh, some useful reports and uh, contribution in subsequent uh, uh, forums or sessions. So I'll hand over to my colleague to start us off. Yeah. Uh, to start off, it is really a great honor for Tom and me to be chosen as moderator for this International Women's Day Conference. You may wonder, why us? I also s ask the same question myself. We came from different backgrounds and training, but we have the same aspiration, that is to be a big help to the community we are in. Sure, let me also take this opportunity to introduce my colleague, Omali. She is Maria Luisa Salingay from the Philippines. She is a chemist by profession and by training. And uh, she has undertaken quite uh, extensive training and one of them was by offered by the chemical safety officer uh, by the US Department uh, Pollution Control uh, Department. And uh, the other thing that maybe you might not know, together and I, we were part of the sub-executive, that is the Student Association Board of the IHE. She was the president and uh, I was a deputy, so she was my former boss, in a way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, thank you so much, Tom. Uh, it is really a, an honor to be my teammate also. We always have a good chemistry together from the start until now, that we are no longer the sub. Okay, allow me to, because we're asked to do a speech as moderator and what our experience, then allow me to have a little, uh, telling you about what my experience is. I will start by saying, why am I here? Why am I studying in UNESCO IHE? Why am I doing MSc in water quality management when I already had an MSc in physical science, major in chemistry, minor in physics? With a stable job in the government, comfortable life, and a happy family with four beautiful kids. I left my comfort zone, so to speak, but why? My experience with tropical cyclone, Washi, locally known as Sendong, changed my perception in life. It happened on the night of 16 December 2011, which made me determined to come to Netherlands the country that would give me the best water education. I came from a country surrounded by water. Philippines is an archipelago of more than 7,100 islands, which has an average of 20 typhoons or tropical storm each year. Strong ones could kill hundreds and sometimes thousands of people. Filipinos just accept this fate as normal way of life. If the government agency, which is we call Pagasa, releases tropical cyclone warning based on kilometer per hour expected within the next hours, signal number one is automatic, means no classes for preschool, signal number two for high school and under, signal number three and four, no classes at all levels and offices, private and government. The latest typhoon, Haiyan, which is you all know, that happened four months ago, last 8 November, was more than signal number four. It was a super typhoon that smashed our nation, that killed more than 6,000 people 
and affected more than 14 million Filipinos. Filipinos were always aware of typhoons coming. For typh Typhoon Hayan, classes were suspended even two days earlier before the landfall. But it was too much to bear. I waited for use without sleeping, and my Skype to my family back home was online 24 hours. But unfortunately, when it had its first and second landfall, internet communication was out. Brown out. And I said to myself, oh my God, what happened? I was praying all night to please God move the direction of the wind a little bit higher so my family will be spared. God answered my prayer. But guilt had eaten me when I saw the affected areas. After waiting for hours, I saw live national and international telecasts on television and seeing dead people crying for help bring back memories to me. I did some extension and community act activities as early as 13 years old to prisoners in jail, people living in mountains of garbage and trust, informal settlers, sick, sick people in hospital, cleanup drive on shoreline of full domestic waste in order to plant mangroves, and walking more than seven kilometers, climbing slopey mountain and another seven kilometers down just to plant trees were nothing compared to the experience I had with Typhoon Sindong. You could never explain the feelings of seeing dead people on the streets, survivors walking like zombies, begging for food and water. It was terrible. That was more than two years ago for me. I thought the feeling of getting over it was done, but it wasn't. With the last typhoon, depression, frustration of doing nothing because I am in Netherlands, sink down into me. I cried bucket of tears for a week in my room until I got calls, emails, and messages in my Facebook from friends, IHE staff, and professors asking if I am fine. The comforting words come mostly from ladies or women. There were few men, but I could say that these men got their soft hearts from their mother or grandmother. <laughs> Tremendous international aid came to the country for recovery and rehabilitation. And thank you so much. Filipinos will always be grateful to you for life. With typhoons coming regularly, Filipinos consider it as a part of life. This Aster Risk Management is incorporated into the curriculum, even to primary school in the country. It has been a part of school accreditation and regular drill are done regularly even to preschoolers at age four, five, and six. Annual damages caused by typhoon affected our economy. Damages of typhoon Pablo cost 1 billion USD and Hayan 804 million USD. To have such damage annually, it really breaks our economy. As others may say, the country received more aids than it loses. But it is not the cost that matter but the cost of human lives. Talking further about the role of woman, allow me to quote Eleanor Roosevelt. I quote, nobody can make you feel inferior without your permission, unquote. Centuries ago, women were perceived as fragile and were never involved in decision-making. What started as a domestic setup of father, husband, and brothers deciding for the whole family has evolved into a universal role, a role for men. Our society has fallen so deep in this niche that in the modern times, women who were able to break through this thick and deeply entrenched wall of gender bias has to possess this inevitable will to shine, to be recognized, to be heard, to be appreciated, and to be respected. It is heartening to note that presently, the strength of women is not only shown in the political arena, 
my endless respect to my idol, the late Margaret Thatcher. Women have started to show fearless spirit in the face of execution to advance their causes. Gender equality have gone beyond the four corners of the boardroom, beyond the hierarchy of authority in the organization. Gender equality means equal chances to every opportunity, men and women alike. But how do we attain this faith? Today, our world has radically changed in terms of perception or attitude. I strongly believe that gender equality can, also, can be bought about through women empowerment and should start at home. The nurturing of gender equality must be placed in the core of, the very, of our society, which is the family. Every member of the family should have equal rights to self-expression, must be encouraged and supported. With self-expression comes self-confidence, then self-affirmation, the integrity of the self. Advocating for gender equality, the recognition of women's capability is useless if we ourselves do not recognize our worth. And we are thinking individuals that we have the capacity to lead and we possess inherent value to influence others so that we can move forward a noble cause and we have the right to success as everyone does. In all kinds of disaster, we need help from both men and women. We need the strength of men and the soft, sensitive heart of the women. And both minds of men and women to work together to solve problems, especially in emergency cases. And allow me to quote Plato, the women. If women are expected to do the same work as men, we must teach them the same. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, this time, allow me to introduce my co-moderator, a man very much experienced and exposed to the biggest refugee camp of Kenya. He is a man who is a technical expert in the making, in the fields of hydrology and water resources, have some experience in the field of water and sanitation in emergency setting. He also repairs broken heart and broken eggshell. My teammate, Tom George Ugo. Actually, that was supposed to be broken water tanks and broken <laughs> pipes. Yeah, sometimes it's very hard to talk after your senior, like the president she was. So when the deputy comes, you feel like you should not outshine the president. But I try my best. <laughs> um, I'm just going to give you a free uh, a remarks based on my experience before I came to IHE, and now that I'm in IHE, and uh, possibly after this, it will contribute to stimulate our thinking for the sake of these discussions thereafter. Uh, I worked in the Dadaab uh, refugee camp. The Dadaab refugee camp is in the north uh, eastern part of Kenya. It's uh, quite a semi-arid and to some extent arid area. We usually experience uh, quite hot temperatures and uh, quite droughts, long drought periods. And uh, the Dadaab refugee camp is coordinated by the UNSCR <coughs> and it was established in 1991. It has grown to a complex of five camps and uh, it plays a host to over 400,000 refugees. So if the Dadaab camp was to be ranked in by population uh, in the number of towns in Kenya, it will be the fourth largest uh, town in Kenya. So, 30, about 30 international development organizations uh, implement uh, their programs in Dadaab. And uh, the Kenya government has done quite a lot of uh, commendable job to try and host and provide a conducive environment for all this uh, to take place. I was working for the Nef uh, Norwegian Refugee Council uh, under the Water and Sanitation Hygiene Program. And uh, we were mandated to provide water, sanitation, and hygiene promotion services to 160,000 
uh, refugees in one of the camps called Hagadera. That's the largest camp within the Dadaab setup. So, in my in the course of my work, I interacted a lot with the refugees. I worked with them. I visited them. I shared even meals with them. And uh, during that process, I got to feel their frustrations, to share into their hopes, aspirations, and I got first. Uh, it was actually a first-hand experience for me. And. Uh, Based on our topic and the theme for today, tapping in the unlocked uh, potential of women in, in emergency, I'd like just to give a few pointers based on my experience and uh, what I think can contribute to the way forward from the norm. First, from my experience and what I've gone through, I realized that just like men, women do have ambitions and aspirations. It's not limited to only men, and that applies to also women in these kind of setups. And I believe empowering women, equipping them with skills and knowledge, and basic knowledge, they are able to harness the resources available around them to be able to generate some sort of livelihood or even income. Uh, given a, a setup like the, the Dub Camp is quite big and it has been in existence for a very long time, we are talking over 20 years here it tends to take a life of its own and even form its own economy. And uh, we will see that since it contributes to the wider economy of the region, uh, women in these areas can be empowered to also participate in contributing in this economy, not just from receiving from the aid organizations, but also contributing to the local economies. Uh, my colleague just mentioned about Margaret Thatcher, and I remember the late Margaret Thatcher once said, uh, when you want anything said, you ask a man, and if you want anything done, you ask a woman. <laughs> I believe that is possible after you empower the women. So let us invest in the proactiveness of women. I also think my second point will be women are the pillars of uh, the b basic unit of the society that or any community, and that is the family. And uh, in this kind of setup, the women are mostly looked up to in terms of providing for the family, taking care and nurturing of the children within the family. And that's actually, if you look at it from a daily point of view, it, take, it consumes like the almost the whole 24 hours of the day, apart from the sleep time. And I think if you enable uh, men and also children to have opportunities, that keeps them busy, that uh, enables them to realize the importance on the role the women play in the community, then you will be able to provide some ample time for the women to also develop other skills uh, and uh, follow up on uh, identify what other strengths uh, they have that can enable them develop themselves. So I see one way of also empowering women or pro promoting women in this case is to uh, create opportunities for men and women uh, and children too. Also, I think um, for my third point is participatory approach in terms of decision making. Yeah, and especially when you set out to assist the women, it's very important. And uh, practical examples we've had in the field is that you need to. Participate, have the women participate in the decision making. If you <coughs> are thinking of, let's say, providing a certain service or a certain facility for the women, then involve them in from the word go as, as key stakeholders. Because non participatory approaches as evidence will lead your noble idea or your good intention rather useless because the women might not. You might provide something to the women that they don't really need. It is because of your own imagination or your own thinking. A case is told uh, of a situation in Tanzania or in a remote area. I don't really quite remember the name, but uh, a very good, uh, reputable international organization went to drill a borehole yeah, so as to provide uh, women with water. But the women, uh, the people, local community were really not involved 
in the whole process of uh, uh, setting it up and up to the drilling and the installation and up to the commissioning of the borehole. So <coughs> after a certain period of time, that is one year, the same organization came to do what they call the M&A, &E, as in the NGO world is the monitoring, uh, monitoring and evaluation, uh, commonly referred to as M&E &E in the NGO world. And when they came, they realized that the women actually never used the borehole as intended. They still preferred to trek several kilometers to the main river to fetch their water. And also, part of the borehole's uh, system had been vandalized. And a simple study or research done on it revealed that the women still preferred their own tradition of walking because that's the time they could get to catch up have a chit chat <laughs> as they walk to the, to the river and uh, that's when they can discuss their issues so bringing the borehole maybe looked like it will spoil the fun or something of the sort so it's very important for any organization or any individual to involve the women in some of these uh, key things lastly it's good to provide protection for the vulnerable in the society especially the disabled, the minority groups, and the, those groups that are stigmatized, because the women form a key part of these groups. And uh, if you find in the society, women are more compassionate towards this group. So we need to, to avail or provide protection services to, so that we can be able to accommodate the, uh, the entire population. And last but not least, education is important also, since I believe an informed woman will be able to be in a better position to make decisions and choices. And also, informed men will appreciate and understand the roles women play in their families and communities at large. So that closes my short remark. And now, just before we introduce our guests to present uh, their speeches to you, I uh, would like to inform you we have a series of guests and uh, according to our schedule, for those who have read and uh, or might not have read the program, we have uh, six speakers in total. And the conference is divided, will be in two parts. The first part, we will have three speakers back to back. And then after the second part, we'll have the next two, three speakers, but uh, two speakers will do a joint presentation. Um, at the end of each presentation, we will welcome you to participate uh, by asking your questions or making your comments. And depending on how we fare on with time, uh, we will allow about three to five questions. So I'll welcome Maria to introduce our guest. Uh, thank you so much, Tom. It is my honor to introduce to you our keynote speaker, the first keynote speaker for this afternoon. She comes at UN's HCR. But first, allow me to introduce what is UNHCR. It is United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. It is also known as UN Refugee Agency, an agency mandated to protect and support refugees at the request of a government or the UN itself and assist in their voluntary repatriation, local integration, or resettlement to a third, con third country. Our speaker today is, uh, comes from UNHCR headquarters from Nepal, where she was deputy re representative for four years. She has worked with UNHCR in Sudan, Geneva, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Kenya and with the United Nations mission in Cambodia and Haiti. She had held position with civil society organization and was refugee policy director for Human Rights Watch 
liaison officer for the Women's Refugee Commission, and a research fellow for, at the Norwegian Institute of Human Rights and the Institute for Women Rights at the Faculty Law of University of Oslo. She is an appointed Deputy Director of the Bureau for Europe of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee as of 15 of September 2013. Please help me welcome Diane Goodman. Thank you very much, Marie and Tom. Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to be here with you today to mark the occasion of International Women's Day. And it's a great honor for you and HCR to participate in this conference looking at tapping into the unlocked potential of women in emergencies. Today, I will be looking at the situation of displaced women with a particular focus on refugee women women who have had to flee to another country on account of war, violence, or persecution. I will be examining the question as to whether, notwithstanding the terrible and tragic circumstances which displaced women find themselves in, can displacement also provide an opportunity for their empowerment. I won't be talking about water, and I think that's a good thing, particularly after listening to the introductory remarks of our two moderators and their enormous and incredible qualifications. So, uh, so I certainly won't be talking about water, but I certainly hope that uh, the messages that I give to you today will be relevant for your work. Um, I'd also like to begin my remarks with starting my, a story about not my first assignment with you in HCR, but my second one, and Tom, my first assignment with UNHCR was in the Dadaab refugee camps in 1992. So um, they look quite different, I imagine, than when you were working with them. We had about 30,000 refugees, but they've been there for quite a long time. No, so my second assignment with, with UNHCR was when I arrived as a junior field officer in Tanzania, which was almost 20 years ago to this day. I arrived in Tanzania in the wake of the genocide in Rwanda, which resulted in the death of an estimated 800,000 pe people in just three months, and which caused over two million people to flee to neighboring countries, including Tanzania. The situation was completely overwhelming, and it was hard to even imagine the horrors which the refugees had suffered. And Gert, I have to say that my first experience in terms of gender wasn't so positive as yours, Maybe that's because we didn't have Canadian uh, field officers in charge of the camps. Um, you can guess I'm Canadian. No, seriously, <laughs> um, as I worked in the refugee camps, I noticed that women had not, in fact, been included in the refugee committees which had been established and which played a critical role in providing assistance and protection to the refugee community. Now, I know the importance of including women in these, in these committees might seem rather obvious to us today. But at that time, it wasn't obvious to my senior male colleagues who were in charge of the program, nor to the male refugees themselves, who were quite happy to run this show. And the arguments they made sounded all too familiar. This is an emergency, said my male colleagues, so we really don't have time for that. Our focus has to be on assistance delivery. The male refugees voiced other concerns. If women participate in these committees, who's going to look after the children? Women are working there, women simply don't have the skills for it. And their favorite argument was, what's going to be happen if the female committee members become pregnant? In any event, working with the refugee women to overcome the resistance of my, both my co-workers and the refugees, it was agreed that women could serve on these committees. And with time, they became highly valued members, earning the respect of their male counterparts and the refugee community as a whole. While I had naively hoped that we would never again see war and displacement, 
on the magnitude and scale of the Rwandan emergency. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Today, the world is facing humanitarian tragedies on an unimaginable scale. Since December 2012, violence and instability have forced close to a million people in the Central African Republic to flee. More than 700,000 are internally displaced and more than 280,000 have fled to neighboring countries, including Northern DRC and Chad. This crisis comes on the heels of the Mali emergency where war, drought, and starvation had driven some 170,000 Malians to seek refuge across their borders and over 280,000 to be displaced within their country. In South Sudan, where I worked in 2007 and 2008, and for which there was so much hope in 2011 when the country gained its independence, a conflict is raging with 740,000 people internally displaced and 196,000 seeking safety in neighboring countries. And last but not least is the brutal conflict in Syria, which has resulted in the displacement of 6.5 million people within Syria and caused over 2.5 million people to flee to neighboring countries, namely Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, and Egypt. These figures are so staggering that we run the risk of glazing over them and forgetting that behind these crises and emergency are women and men, boys and girls, whose lives, families, communities, livelihoods, and environment have been destroyed by forced displacement. For these reasons, we need to reflect very carefully when we talk about the potentially positive impact of an emergency on women and their role in families and communities. We must always be cognizant of the trauma, pain, and suffering experienced by displaced women, men, boys, and girls, and recognize that such experiences can be extremely disempowering for, disempowering for women. And I think uh, Maria highlighted many of that when she talked about the recent emergencies in the Philippines. I know that my colleagues that work there have found it so, so difficult to, to work there, but also so, so rewarding, actually, to be able to help the community. In the context of, of emergencies, women who are traditionally responsible for children, elders, and domestic work are often overburdened during displacement. Frequently relegated to the domestic fear, sphere, women must often depend on male relatives for access to basic necessities. In urban areas, they often remain completely hidden from view. Women may be too busy surviving and protecting their dependents that they have little time to attend meetings or training sessions or participate in projects offered by humanitarian actors. An increase in violence against women, including domestic violence, and the absence of policing or judicial mechanisms means that violence against women is often undetected, unreported, and not addressed. Nevertheless, forced displacement can also be an empowering experience for women. Their experiences during displacement and the changes in gender roles, which are often brought about by necessity during displacement, may even enable women to overcome gender barriers and participate in the political and economic and social realms which previously were not accessible to them. UNHCR's experience working with displaced women in emergencies has clearly demonstrated that the inclusion of women in WASH, camp management, economic life, delivery of assistance, community mediation and community outreach, among other, among other programs, can widen the range of choices available to them, give them greater control over their future, and enhance the quality of their lives and those of their families and communities. Moreover, the participation of women is essential to ensure that their needs, concerns, and protection risks are addressed in the overall humanitarian response. Failure to do so will mean that resources may be inaccurately targeted and the protection problems women and children face regarding their security and access to services may be exacerbated. And I really like Tom's example of, of the borehole. I'm sure that agency that you mentioned was in UNHCR. Um, looking at the response, at the humanitarian response in today's current emergencies, it is evident that there is now a clear institutional commitment by UNHCR and other humanitarian actors to ensure the active participation of women in all refugee 
management and leadership committees and to promote gender equality and the empowerment of women in all that we do. Lebanon serves as an excellent example in this respect. Lebanon is currently hosting 950,000 Syrian refugees, 78% of whom are women and children. Addressing the protection risks they face, such as sexual and gender-based violence, child separation, early marriages, and child labor is challenging, not only because the refugees are highly dispersed in urban areas, but also due to cultural and traditional practices. However, UNHCR and other actors in Lebanon are promoting a, ser a series of initiatives to empower women and girls, increase interaction with them, and support their participation in the protection response. Many of these activities take place in locally based structures and centers which provide opportunities for sharing and exchange amongst the refugee and host community women. These include vocational training, livelihood opportunities, job matching, and referrals to microfinance activities. Targeted legal awareness sessions with a focus on issues and procedures that are really of concern and interest to women, such as birth registration, civil documentation, and family law are also provided. In Lebanon, the sheer number of refugees, their enormous needs, and the limited capacities of the humanitarian community makes mobilization of the resources and skills of the refugees essential. Consequently, UNHCR is implementing a refugee outreach volunteer program with 116 refugee volunteers who provide a two-way communication channel to promote interaction with refugees, share and analyze community concerns, and refer persons in need of support to UNHCR, specialized agencies, and service providers. More than half of these volunteers are women, and this provides a powerful channel to facilitate women's participation and highlight their needs and priorities, as well as empower the women themselves. One of the most innovative projects in Lebanon is a catering project for Syrian refugee and, Le and Lebanese women. This project promotes expression through cooking, allows for income generation opportunities, and by joining refugee and host community women, enhances social cohesion. This project is becoming a model for other partners and is being replicated as a good practice in many community centers. I would now like to show you a short video about this project in which the women themselves express their thoughts about the impact of the participation in this initiative. And I hope the video will work. I'm not very technologically savvy, so I'm hoping Tom is gonna to be able to assist. I will give you the link and I really encourage you to watch, watch, this, watch this video because, I mean, it's a great video. You have the, wi the women, um, they get training in food management and presentation, and the food looks so good. <laughs> um, so, uh, and it's a great project in that it brought them together, it empowered them, and they were doing something that they loved together, which is a point also that Tom raises, that for many women, they need this opportunity in their day to sit together, to talk together, to share experiences, and over cooking food through this project, it really, it really was a great experience for them. And those are the kind of innovative projects that we really need to work towards in our work. So now I'm going to turn back to the question which I asked at the beginning of my remarks. Can displacement also provide an opportunity for empowerment? My answer to this question would be yes. Furthermore, when women are empowered, it can potentially have an enormous positive impact not only of the lives of the women themselves, but also of their families and communities. However, empowering displaced women requires much more than simply including them in refugee communities, in refugee committees, or livelihood projects. Based on UNHCR's experience working with refugee women, men, boys, and girls, we have found that the following are important factors in this respect. First, and this was highlighted in the video, um, skills training is essential. In order to run a catering business, you need to know how to cook, but that's not all. You need to know how to present the food, what to charge, and how to run a business. It is not enough to give women microcredit loans. They need accounting and entrepreneurship skills. This does not necessarily mean that women need to be literate 
and in Nepal, where I previously worked, one of the most successful businesses was run by a woman who did not know how to read or write. Moreover, the skills which women learn in order to become successful leaders can have a positive impact on other areas of their lives. Women engaged in conflict mediation in Nepal told me that because they had received such excellent mediation training, they learned invaluable communication skills, became more confident, and were much better at dealing with anger management. Secondly, economic empowerment is critical. In an emergency and its aftermath, the first priority of women is to provide for their families, and they worry about taking leadership positions, which means that their families will suffer as a result because they aren't able to earn any income. We risk not retaining women in leadership roles if they do not receive some kind of economic incentive or even are at a financial loss by doing so. Third, some of the most successful projects, and this is um, also illustrated <laughs> in the catering project, um, is that um, those offer uh, opportunity for women, host community women and refugee women to work together because it helps to break stereotypes and also combat xenophobia. And such, in, such initiatives are not only important in the refugee context, but also in the post-conflict return. Projects which can engage returning refugee women and women who never left can play a critical role in the peace and reconciliation process. Fourth, like women all over the world, the biggest challenge that women in leadership positions in displacement face is managing not only their work, but their roles as wives and mothers and daughters. Support systems which enable women to accept these leadership roles must be in place. Which leads to my next and almost final point, which is the importance of the support of family members and in particular male family members. Therefore, if we really want to achieve women's empowerment, we have to work in partnership with men. In Nepal, we, we implemented a project whereby refugee men of different ages were brought together and explored their gender perceptions through photography. After participating in a workshop on gender roles, they also learned photographic skills and were encouraged to visualize their thoughts through photographic narratives. The moving, the moving photographs, which portrayed both women and men in non-traditional roles as well as traditional roles, were exhibited in a photo exhibition in the camp called The Changing Lens of Gender. It is this last issue, and it's the same issue which I encountered 20 years ago when I began working with UNHCR, which is probably the most difficult to address. Empowerment of women requires a change, a change in the attitudes of women and men, and a change in social and gender norms, which are deeply entrenched in the social and economic structures of many communities. However, I believe this change is possible. I open my remarks with a personal story, and I would like to close by sharing with you the story of 35-year-old Rocky, a refugee woman from Mali who's currently in Burkina Faso. Her most important possession is a broom that she made from shrubs collected near her home in the arid Saho region of northern Mali. Rocky took it with her when she fled to Burkina Faso in April last year after armed men attacked her village during the Malian conflict. Rocky was traumatized by the attack, the shock of flight, and the loss of kin. However, she knew she had to do something to shake herself out of depression and to help her make something out of her new life as a refugee. So she decided to start sweeping at first just around her own traditional nomad shelter. With support from UNHCR's community service staff, she formed a cleanliness group gathering mainly women. They had such an impact on the cleanliness of the camp as well as empowering women that Rocky was appointed to head one of the eight com committees which were set up in different areas of the camp by UNHCR to help coordinate services. Rocky and her team of 12 refugees have had such success in improving the operation of the camp's water, sanitation and hygiene system. By keeping the camp clean and spreading awareness about the importance of sanitation and hygiene, they have helped avert the spread of diseases such as diarrhea and cholera, which are a threat in northern Burkina because of poor hygiene practices and water shortages. And perhaps the most remarkable tribute is from a man in the male-dominated Tuareg culture, a refugee who explained that Rocky helps us to understand that we can make a big change in our lives through small actions. Thank you very much.
very much, Diane Goodman, for your speech. And now we would like to open up uh, the floor for questions from the audience. And uh, we'll give you an opportunity to ask about three questions before we pr proceed to the next guest. Uh, we have wireless microphones around the, the hall. Once you, uh, if you have a question, you can just raise your hand and we'll give you the microphone. Anyone? We're still there, just yes, sir. Thank you for your presentation, but I have a question or comment. You speak about, I think, the bright days of refugee in, in the camps, but you don't mention anything about the dark life in the camp. Do you hear me? Here I have some numbers. It's uh, especially for Syrian refugee in, Syria, in, in Lebanon or in Al Zaatari camp in Jordan. This number is uh, the main victim for this number is the woman. And especially the year is between from 10 till 18. And I. Uh, sorry, it's And I don't know why in, uh, I cannot find this information in your presentation. And I, I hit here and I saw a little about from the, the uh, your okay uh, from the video uh, the video clip that it's like a reclamo to show what we doing good things in the the camp the refugee camp. But in the in, in, in last winter, uh, 36 persons are dying from cold, suffering. A lot of children dying because no food. This is right or not? I'm not saying that it's easy in the refugee camps, and actually, I don't think actually any children died this year from food in any of the camps. So. I think I highlighted in the remarks that it's traumatic and terrible and tragic to be a refugee. Um, but there are some opportunities for the community working together and us working in the community to also have a positive impact. And what I was highlighting um, was the situation with respect to Jordan, where I mean with Lebanon, sorry, where they have implemented, you know, some positive programs. So. I'm not suggesting that it's good to be a refugee, but I'm suggesting that women have drawn on their own strength in, in these circumstances and have been able to, yeah, have been able to move forward on in, with their lives, which is extraordinary. Any more questions? Thank you. You told us that you know, one of the main things is uh, strengthening by education and strengthening by giving uh, some money for making their own business. Uh, can you tell us how are you organizing that uh, education uh, project? Well, in terms of education, I mean, it depends on the, on the particular project and it depends on the particular um, um, camp. Because in many countries, refugees aren't actually allowed to work. So sometimes in the camp, um, I would say from my own experience in Nepal, we would give uh, incentives, which weren't really uh, payments because we weren't allowed to give payments, but compens some kind of incentive for which they weren't. So, for example, in you know a micro a micro credit project we did, we brought specialists in that were, you know, helping women on accounting, on finance, on learning the running a small business. When we did mediation, 
we would bring, you know, we'd always work with the national counterparts. Um, we'd bring in organizations that were that ran mediation skills uh, training within the country, and they would provide, you know, training for the women. So, what kind of training? And in the catering business, they actually worked with quite a well-known uh, catering company in Lebanon. So, it really would depend on what the particular, you know, skill you were trying to impart. I have a chance for two more questions. This other side of the editorial, yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, there's been reports of, uh, of rape um, in various camps, especially in Africa, and um, more especially from the aid workers and those who are supposed to protect these women. So I want to know what your organization is doing to prevent such occurrences and to manage the, the women, uh, because some of them get more devastated by this um, effect, the effects of rape and all that that is happening in the camp. Okay, um, well, sexual and gender-based violence and rape um, is I would say the, the largest protection problem faced by women in the camps and also actually by women in the host communities as well. And as I mentioned in my remarks, domestic violence is a huge problem. So we implement a number of programs with the women themselves um, to try to prevent it, to provide multi-sectoral support for survivors of rape, health, education, legal counseling if they choose, um, uh, livelihood opportunities as well, but it's a serious it's a serious problem, and um, it can't be addressed by UNHCR and the partners alone. It requires the the host governments also take responsibility. It requires working with the police, which we try to do, working with the hospitals, and the whole issue of um, you know sexual exploitation by humanitarian workers. Um, it's also it's also a problem which we try to address, there's a Secretary General zero tolerance policy, so strong action is taken if sexual um, exploitation is found out, but I can't pretend it's an easy problem to address, but it's one that uh, I've personally been engaged in for 20 years and which the, which the organization continues to improve and to work towards with, with the refugee communities and with the host population. Thank you. Uh, one more question from Ms. I thank you for your presentation. I found it very interesting when you mentioned that it requires a change in attitude from both men and women. Um, one question I had, if military is sent abroad, then often they do have to uh, go through a course for raising gender sensitivity. Do you have similar courses by H UNHCR for your aid workers? Yeah, um, we, we have a, a training program that we have training program on, on protection generally, on prevention of sexual and gender-based violence against sexual exploitation. There's mandatory training for all the UN. But, you know, training is just one part of, one part of it, so it's, it's a long process. Okay, thank you very much. One, I just for one last question from this side. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, actually, I would like to congratulate you and FCR for supporting uh, I mean, uh, refugees uh, in many in many countries. Because I'm myself a refugee, and uh, and they, right now. It's just a, a suggestion, if it is possible, especially in the refugees camps, if you can, I mean, like, uh, get some uh, specialists, like professionals in water and uh, sanitary issues to assist in the refugee camp. It's just my suggestion. But I'm really grateful for the support of UNCR. Thank you. Uh, 
um, I'll just say thank you. And I'm happy to, um, yeah, I was amazed when I found out about this institute. As I say, water isn't my um, area of expertise. Uh, and it was quite amazing also to learn about the statistics, how many of the graduates of your institute are working in their own countries, even 20 years later. And um, I'm happy to talk to, to anybody at the break and facilitate any links, if possible, with our experts in water and, and sanitation. That would be my pleasure. And I'm really looking forward to listening to the rest of the conference and, and bringing this back to my organization and to my colleagues. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate. I would first like to apologize for the technical hitch with the link to the video. I hope you'll get an opportunity to view it uh, when the link is sent. Next, we'd like to welcome our next speaker. I see so far we are doing well with time and also with the participation. I would like to welcome Simone Filippini, but before she steps forward, she works for Code Aid, and for those who might not know, Code Aid is an acronym for the Catholic Organization <laughs> for Relief and Development Aid. It is one of the biggest international development organizations with a network of around a thousand partner organizations in 36 countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. It has its headquarters in The Hague, here in Netherlands, and it aims to help people in distress and fight structural poverty through its various programs. Simone, Fil Simone Filippini has a Master's of Arts in Slavic Languages and Literature from the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. After her studies, she followed a three-month training on international relations at the Institute of International Research as a professional conference manager. In 1988, she started her diplomatic career in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and since then, she has been engaged in a broad range of foreign policy-related uh, matters, among them which are development cooperation, Southeast Asia and Oceania, and the Middle East and Gulf regions, human rights issues, and also communication and public diplomacy. Um, also, uh, uh, activities involving the European Union enlargement. She was also posted in Jakarta from 1991 to 1994 and has been the Dutch ambassador to the Macedonia from August 2007 to July 2011 and served as the Consul General for the Southeastern uh, US from 2011 to 2013. Simone has been elected an elected member of the National Board of one of the Dutch political parties and has also served on several board of uh, international NGOs. Uh, join together uh, as we welcome Simone Filippin. Well, thank you very much for introducing me. And maybe just to be clear, I left the diplomatic service in September uh, uh, 12, 13, uh, 2013 to become the general director of Cordate. So I'm not a diplomat anymore. And that's great news because finally I can say whatever I want. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm basically humbled to be here this afternoon. And I must say that I feel we don't have six keynote speakers, but eight keynote speakers. Because I really feel, Tom and Maria, that your speeches before in the beginning were basically setting the stage for the afternoon. and. I really congratulate you with the passionate and contentful um, uh, speeches you, you were presenting to us. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm honored that I am standing here in front of you instead of you being our moderators. I think you were setting the stage also. The, the closest I've ever personally been to a disaster was Flores, <coughs> where I stayed when I was posted in um, Jakarta, I was on holidays and I went to Flores, East Flores, a small village on the seashore, um, going into the sea, snorkeling around uh, at a small uh, island, non-island, which in Indonesia they called Kadang Kadang, 
which probably for the Indonesians present here, if there are any, means yeah, sometimes, sometimes. So when it was high tide, it wasn't there. When it was low tide, it was there. It was a wonderful environment. And then a, a month after I had been there, disaster struck and the whole area was wiped away. And that were where I had stayed in that small hotel on the seashore having my coffee. The, this island, Kadang Kadang, where I had been snorkeling around, the fisher boat that I was transported on, everything had been wiped away. And that was an emotional experience which I will never forget. The people I talked to, they weren't, they weren't there anymore. And so these are issues, they are close to your heart. It, wasn't, it didn't belong, it, it didn't regard my family or anything like in your cases, probably. But, um, but it's something that will never, uh, uh, that it will always keep on touching your heart. Um, I think that I want to start with a very small story, and that's how it often goes. Before the official famine in South Sudan was being declared in 1998, Mary Newbell and a group of 20 women opened a feeding center. And in that feeding center, because basically the famine was going on, it was not officially declared by the international community as such yet, but she, as so many other women and women's groups, started a feeding center and they fed groups of people from their communities for months before any help arrived. They kept people alive on some meat from the animals that they slaughtered, some soup and wild fruits and anything they could find. And they organized themselves and uh, they, they were the survival instruments for the entire community. And ladies and gentlemen, when I heard the title of today, Tapping into the Unlocked Potential of Women in Emergencies, I must say that I scratched my back a little bit because I think we have a problem there. It's not about unlocking potential of women in emergencies. That potential has been long time ago unlocked. And that's why I use that example. There are hundreds and hundreds. We have heard examples here today. The problem is that we have to be unlocked. Our potential to see what is happening, to take people in the field seriously that are living there, that know what they do, who are working constantly on issues, to help to tap into what they're doing and help them to kind of uh, expand what they're doing. Maybe to give them the, the tools to further increase their efforts. It's quite pretentious. It has a sense of we to them, if we talk about tapping into the unlocked potential. It's, uh, I don't know whether you, you feel the same, but I had this feeling, and I think that's one of the basic issues that we face in the all super well-intentioned development efforts that we all undertake, Cordate included. We all make mistakes there, but we try to prevent the mistakes from being made. And as an NGO, we might have an advantage there because we are more flexible, more agile. If you look at the large development corporation institutions of the world, they're very bureaucratic. They work along very bureaucratic lines. Things have been put into procedures, like cemented into procedures, and they can hardly escape from those procedures to take the time and look at what people are doing in the field and how they're struggling. Um, fortunately, I have already been introduced with Cordit. Cordit is indeed one of the uh, biggest multi-mandate, you could say, organizations in the field of development cooperation in the Netherlands becoming more and more international, more and more multi-stakeholder oriented, and more and more innovative. I'm really proud of this organization that I joined only five months ago, and the whole world of development cooperation is turning around, and I'm proud to be part of that process. Because I think if we really co-create together, we could do so much more with the money that's available in this world to help others flourish. And that's 
our mission, building flourishing communities in fragile areas. We orient ourselves, we focus on the most difficult areas in the world. Um, among those, basically all the risk-prone areas, whether it's political risk, whether it's um, natural disasters, we are there and we want to be there and be of assistance. And we have developed kind of systematical approach to these types of issues. I think in humanitarian assistance, uh, women are, as we heard earlier this afternoon, still being considered most of the time as victims, the most vulnerable group disproportionately affected. And that might be so. I mean, there are good reasons to say these things. But at the same time, they're the strongest group. They're the most active group. They are the, the people holding the communities together. We all know that. But unfortunately, we have not been able yet to effectively and efficiently act upon that and especially not together. Because there's also this other phenomenon, we all know it, this elbowing each other away, this crowding out of each other's efforts because we all want to be visible. And when does the time come that we uh, are able to step over our own obstacles, our egos, and work together to really generate the impact that we want to generate, that everybody is after? After the tsunami of 2004 in Sri Lanka, many NGOs focused on specific projects for women as they were being considered the most vulnerable group, as I just said. However, analysis of the impact of disaster on men and women showed that it was actually important to pay specific attention to men. We all know that. It has been said before this afternoon. The fishermen lost their boats and they lost their work, their livelihood. And while the daily needs of the family were catered for by NGOs and others, and the women managed the households and were busy doing what they had to do, the fishermen were kind of lost. I've seen that in practice also, for example, in Irian, where people, where the men were lost. They didn't have their pride, their livelihood, their work anymore, they got lost. And everywhere where such things happen, when people lose their dignity, they start doing things that we don't like them to do. They start to drink, they get aggressive, they get offensive, and that happened there. And so with all the good intentions, it's just one example, small example, the, there were counterproductive, unwished for, and unintentioned results. So what has to be done in the first place, I feel, is that we try to work on disaster risk reduction and building resilient communities so that if disaster strikes, the results, the consequences will be less than otherwise the case. Um, and yes, we have to take people seriously and uh, to that end, we have to be sure that we do a proper gender, ana gender analysis before we start uh, uh, doing our good stuff to, uh, to impact on communities that we really don't know of what the results of our acti activities will be. It's always better to step back a little bit and ask people what they want than to just come on and with your good intentions empower yourself to people. So um, what I feel is that um, we have to fully recognize the contributions of of women in today's disasters, but not only that, we have to tap into them, to buy into them. We have uh, to acknowledge that in the dynamics between men and women, their different roles and capacities, that they are key for community survival. And to make use of, fully use of the dynamics and to influence dynamics in a positive manner, in basically, Ms. Goodman, you were talking about that already, we have to develop a proper insight in what those dynamics in any specific context are. And we just still don't do it adequately. And only then we can say that we not only do no harm, which is basically a kind of basic minimum that you might expect from any intervention put anywhere in the world, um, but that we might be able to influence in a positive way 
the relationships between men and women in order for communities to flourish. And we, at Accordate, we use such a system and we call it Community Managed Disaster Risk Production. And I saw the manual that we, with the people concerned all over the world, developed. Recently I saw it on the desk, proudly being demonstrated by a local government official in Guatemala in the middle of nowhere, because they were using that manual with their communities to build more resilience. And <coughs> if, uh, if you want to know more about the real details of how Cordate works in the field, we have uh, Paul and Rob sitting there in the, um, in the public, uh, two of my colleagues at Cordate who are in, uh, always working in the field and with their feet in the mud, as it were. So if you have questions to me that I won't be able to answer later on, you can always, we, we will immediately turn, let's put it that, we will immediately turn to them. I've been there for five months, so I don't have the pretension that I'm the coordinate expert on uh, community-based um, risk reduction. But let me just briefly at the end come back to, the, um, to this year's theme of International Women's Day, inspiring change. You can look at it as an ad adjective. Oh, what an inspiring change I see happening there. But you can also look at it uh, from the perspective of a verb. It's time that we start inspiring change among ourselves. And that we take the inspiring change taking place in the world to inspire ourselves and others to do the right things. And to those things, right. It's us who have to work on inspiring others to, cha to change their approaches to this crucially important issue of this afternoon. So let me invite you to roll up your and our sleeves and join us in our approach. Thank you very much for uh, your attention this afternoon. Thank you so much for the inspiring speech. Uh, and it is really an honor for us to be considered as the Tom and me to be speakers of also. Course. Well, you were. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I would say my contribution to my community is insignificant. But listening to your last speech, you said like it's time to inspire others. And I would say maybe my contribution is significant. Maybe in a way I could inspire others. Absolutely. It could be small thing, but I think big things come from small things. That's what we just could decide that this afternoon. Thank you also for mentioning that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ms. Molina is ready to answer your question. If I can, and otherwise, you know, I'll refer to the guys there. <laughs> Any question from the audience? Come Can on. You please raise your right hand. So I've been very be vague, so. Uh, thank you. My name is Tessa Kerfse. I, I work for the uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'm working in the uh, department for. Um, natural resources, climate, water, mm -hmm. um, and environment. I've noticed that um, uh, Cordate is, is very active in, in uh, the natural resources and urbanization as one of the key uh, organizations. What's, what, in your opinion, is, is the main, um, are the main issues, the most important issues in, in natural resources uh, protection or protection of people from natural resources disasters? Before I hand the floor to those guys there, um, I, I, I think that uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, most important issues at this moment is water. Well, we are ex absolutely at the right place to make that conclusion. You already mentioned this, but I, I think it's really true. Not only flooding, but also water scarcity. It's uh, the uh, uh, weather conditions are becoming more extreme all the time. So on one hand or the other, when water becomes one of the crucial issues or is already one of the crucial issues of the 21st century, and not only because flooding is a natural disaster and drought is a natural disaster as such, but also because these are sources of new conflicts. And I have already, I worked as the deputy head of the Middle East 
um, and Gulf Region Department, and that was like more or less 20 years ago now. And already then, it was very clear that if we don't solve the issue of water in the Middle East, forget any political solution. <laughs> it, the, the water solution is, is smack in the middle of any solution of the Israeli Arab conflict, for example. And I think that uh, you come from all over the world, as I see. And I think that you also, everybody who is being confronted with that issue, knows that that's happening. I don't know whether um, my colleagues want to add something to what I said. We're doing very well. Thank you very much, Paul. <laughs> so that's encouragement. Yeah. No, we, uh, we in Cordate have a very open attitude to, towards things. As you know, I get direct feedback on my, uh, on my <laughs> presenta presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, any more questions? Uh, I think here in front. You mentioned the manual. Is that also available online on the Cordate site? I don't know whether it's uh, available online. There are also different versions of it, like yes. different language versions. But uh, Paul, do we have? Actually, I'm not sure if the latest version is there yet. Well, okay. could you it's could you see to it that they they is. get it? By the way, all our other data are online, so we are the. Uh, the, uh, uh, the only NGO in the Netherlands, basically, that has all the data online. Um, so we are kind of a trendsetter on the IATI requirements of the future, uh, because we believe in openness and sharing data to get co-creation co going. That's what I was talking about before, because I feel that in the whole world of development cooperation, we now finally have to reach out to each other um, get our act together um, and complement each other instead of fighting each other uh, to get to our goals. Yes, first, I want to compliment you with your excellent presentation. Very impressive. My question is, you are referring to um, your museum programs uh, and cities. There are many organizations like UNSDR, uh, Rockefeller Foundation, who are also working in cities and with cities. Is there any, I would say, collaboration between those programs? Um, well, what we always try to do is to reach out to others. We have uh, lots of cooperation with many organizations that are working like us in the field. We also have many or, uh, uh, cooperation agreements with um, foundations, other found foundations that we even get funded by, to a certain extent. But let me ask my colleagues on this one, because it's quite a specific one, and probably they know much better than I do. I, no? Well, yeah, he knows. He can always try. Well, you know, this kind of collaboration, this kind of coordination has to take place at the lowest level possible, or else you're killing all the initiatives locally. You know, if you start coordinating at the international level, automatically you know, understand each other, you develop a vocabulary, and you eliminate, in fact, your own interventions from what should be really happening, and that is working community-based, community-managed. So it is a matter of, you know, uh, for yourself, uh, uh, defining what is the system level you're working on. Uh, in the Philippines, it would be the barangay level, of course, uh, but in Malawi, it would be county level. Or, uh, and, you and within that system, you look at those who are active, and you're trying to find the win-wins, you're trying to see where do we work from a certain, you know, uh, shared vision, where can we, you know, have, where do we have over overlapping strategies. So, we, on the one hand, we must know, of course, at the international level from each other what we're doing. On the other hand, the real coordination and the real, you know, uh, finding synergy is taking place at the lower level. Yeah, basically that's happening everywhere when people are successfully working on disaster risk management or disaster prevention. I, I just lived in Miami for the past two years. And you can see, well, Florida has an excellent, excellent disaster risk management system. And that also happens. So the, you now have a kind of framework according to which they have to, uh, to act, but they do it all at county level. And they take over. They don't let others dominate their agenda and basically if you trans transfer that type of approach to other countries it's exactly the same 
uh, the better people are locally organized and when they have gone through this community managed disaster risk reduction manual they do it themselves so it's not that we go going there and tell them you you have to do this they do it themselves and then they are the owners of their own plan and the owners of their own situation and solutions so that makes it really very interesting i think that's what people tell you when you're there and that also and i think that's an extremely healthy situation uh, which enables them to say well, to those well doing our external people who come in and want to do something oh stop we have our own approach we know what to do we are fine uh, no it, it's a kind of healthy ego thing i mean who are we to tell them what to do that support them to enable them to improve on what they're doing already so th that happens there and i talked to those people and i thought uh, it's very impressive how, how strong and conf and full of confidence they were on their own plans No, my name is Milan Junius. I'm an elderman here in the city of Delft. Okay. Uh, and uh, I remember a commercial by Corday to think the other way around. And uh, you just talked about un uh, unlocking the potential. And I was uh, wondering like, how, if you have any recommendation for uh, uh, the government in Delft to think the other way around and to support the people. There are a lot of people from UNESCO mm -hmm. from all the countries and uh, uh, also in our community to think the other way around and not thinking that we should tell them and think that we should help um, mm -hmm. do you have any recommendations of course or a you manual? use our manual <laughs> <laughs> it's, al uh, it's also possible to use the manual here of course. of course and and it's interesting we are um, we are now developing a uh, flourishing community index because we are all about flourishing communities yeah. And uh, that flourishing community index will not only, it's being made with the help of people from all over the world, and it will tap into certain um, issues that are very important in any case for people to feel that they're part of a flourishing community. Of course, they can weigh those several elements differently, depending where they are. And the good thing is, we can also use them in the Netherlands. And in any, we could even measure in the future uh, this this meeting room, whether we feel we're part of a flourishing community. Well, so so that maybe that might be that's something a, for you to use. That's a very good start. And tomorrow it's International Women's Day, so that's right. we'll make a start. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Can we have the last question there? Last question, yeah. Um, uh, as you talked about uh, preventing the crisis before it happens, um, does your rule cover, for example, interfering in um, in the problem for the Ethiopian dam between Egypt and the Ethiopia? I mean, do you um, have a saying in that? Do you do in your rule? I don't know. Are we involved? We, of course, part of what you do is is also always connecting to local to local governments because you need no local governments to enable people to do what they have to do and they have to actively support, so active support of local government is always necessary. I don't know whether in this specific case we are involved. We are not world leaders yet, unfortunately, but we are doing our best to grow. And I, I, do, I don't know, uh, Paul or Rob, whether we are involved in any way in the problem, but we are in Ethiopia, and whenever we come across certain issues that require attention, we will take them along in our in our uh, talks to government officials, but it will always be done kind of behind the screens. You have different types of organizations. Coordinate is an organization that works more behind the screens and working on success, but not on in a campaigning way. We are not a campaign organization. Like uh, you have more like Oxfam or Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International. They're more, they, they are campaign organizations and fantastic. I mean, those organizations have to be there. We work in a different manner. And um, so you, you might not uh, know us so quickly because we are not that visible, but uh, most of the time we are there where the heat is on. Yeah. And thank you so much. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, I like your guideline, like if you cannot solve water conflict, do not solve political conflict.
Okay. Our next speaker for this afternoon is from United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Reduction, or UNISDR. UNISDR is a Secretariat of International Strategy for Disaster Reduction, ISDR. It is the successor of the Secretariat of International Decade for Natural Disaster Reduction with the purpose of ensuring the implementation of International Strategy for Disaster Reduction. Before I introduce the speaker, allow me to show you a video. Our next speaker is a specialist advisor and dispute resolution, resolution, information issues, and digital technology. Her expertise includes designing system for conflict resolution, mediation, and other alternative dispute resolution. She is also a specialist on the legal and ethical application of information technology, the internet, electronic commerce, electronic banking, international trade, finance, and telecommunication. He has been working with the Australia and USA Dispute Resolution Program since 1994. She has worked with OECD, APEC, Working Group on Electronic Commerce, and the New Zealand Law Society as a facilitator and presenter on law and the internet, and on privacy, the International Standard Organization as a consumer policy representative, Standard New Zealand as a member of Computer Security Committee and the European Union Telecommunication Data Protecting Working Group. She is the author of Report of Cyberspace Law published in New Zealand in 1998 and currently impressed by UNESCO in Paris, the leading text on New Zealand privacy law. Please help me welcome the, the director of UNISDR, Ms. Elizabeth Longworth.
thank you very much. And uh, it's a great privilege to be here. Um, that was all true, but clearly somebody sent the wrong CV, so my apologies for that. Uh, and you'll be wondering, what on earth is this woman doing here? <laughs> <laughs> so, if it's any consolation, I'm the director of the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, and uh, I, before that, was working in the social sciences, which included a global environmental change program, climate migration, and before that, in the economic development. So, um, but everything was true. <laughs> so, uh, just just to make just to make the little leap there, uh, it's a it's a great pleasure to be here though, and I want to thank thank um, UNESCO uh, uh, IHE for this opportunity to to be here. Um, and we had the benefit last night to actually meet our uh, fabulous moderators, and uh, actually there were there were several people there. There's another one as well. Maybe she's coming on later wherever she is, there you are. <laughs> and uh, all the speakers before me who have said how inspiring they are uh, is, are absolutely spot on. And I must say I've really enjoyed the, the hearing the other speakers who have really put our, our topic uh, um, into context today. Can I get a feel please for how many of you um, would know what I'm talking about when I say disaster risk reduction? How many of you actually come from that community? So I can get a feel for this. Okay, all right, thank you. So that, the video that we, you just saw was actually uh, a video that we produced to, to celebrate women, uh, the, the role of women in disaster risk reduction. Uh, we, every year we, there's an international day that we celebrate and that was the 2012 campaign where we were talking about women as the invisible force in disaster risk re reduction and it probably encapsulates what I, what I want to speak about today. I really want to take us through three questions about why, why is gender important in this topic and what progress have we actually made and what are we going to do about the next 25 years? Do you recognise this? It's, um, it's BAM. The city of Bam in, uh, in Iran in 1993 earthquake. So I think from this morning, uh, not this morning, the, pr the previous uh, speakers, we, we know too well what that means uh, for the people and their lives and their livelihoods. Can you recognise this one? Have you seen this shot before? This is Caracas in Venezuela. And as you can see, these are the favelas or the slums that are built on very steepened uh, hillside and they're built there knowing the risk of landslide. So they know the risk, but for all sorts of socioeconomic reasons, um, the dwellings are here. And that's what we're about. We're about, we're a small office whose mandate it is, granted by the General Assembly, to try and work on connecting and convincing, bringing the evidence, bringing the global monitoring system and trying to convince governments and all the other stakeholders that this is where we need to be working. So all the fantastic work that we've been hearing about on emergency relief from the, from the other speakers, a uh, small amount of effort that goes into the awareness and the evidence and the other solutions would go a long way in terms of investment so that we don't have um, the disasters from these natural uh, events. Now you'll be relieved to know that I'm not going to take you through this, but I wanted to say that this issue, the framework, the conceptual framework for disaster risk reduction has been around since 1994 Yokohama strategy. And uh, you have your disaster impact and you have all your political risk, your political factors, your risk factors, how vulnerable how vulnerable we are, the various hazards that we face, geological, you know, earthquakes, storm surge, cyclone, drought, biological, pandemic, um, technological, nuclear. And uh, we have our social, social uh, cultural factors, the awareness we're raising, the knowledge development we need, the political commitment we need, all the interdependencies uh, in the ecosystems through to the measures that we can take uh, the, the risk at the early identification, the risk assessment, early warning, preparedness, 
emergency management, uh, and that whole um, interconnection there is the framework for disaster risk reduction, which after the horrific um, earthquake and tsunami in 2004 that a number of you have mentioned already, that got translated into a political document. It was signed up by 168 countries and then endorsed by the General Assembly called the Hyogo Framework for Action. And it's got five pri priorities. And uh, this is important because we are, at the moment, as we speak, negotiating the next 25 years of what comes after this document, because it actually expires in, in 2015. And uh, you will see that um, it's about everything that governments are meant to do, working with the other stakeholders on creating the enabling environment and the political leadership, uh, bringing in the scientific community, uh, trying to get the social awareness and the education going through to reducing the underlying risk factors, which is the development agenda, through to being prepared and ready to act and able to, to, to have the right kind of plans and management plans for a disaster and to come with an effective response, which is your humanitarian agenda. So what, is, what does that mean if we start at the sort of classical starting point of um, what is the impact of disasters on women? Now, I think it's been already explained, but there's some, there's some basic things here if I start this way. Women are obviously at far greater risk of injury and death uh, in a disaster. If a flood who's going to be swept away first in many societies because many women, they don't have the life-saving skills. As uh, girls, they're not, uh, it's, it's, they're not out there running around and climbing the trees. They're probably doing the housework and the chores, probably getting the, the wood and the water. Um, there's a whole lot of social uh, constructs and a whole lot of socioeconomic factors that put women in a very different position uh, from the rest of the uh, society. And then you've got issues in terms of um, the, the division of labour. For example, uh, the number of women who are out gathering the water, um, getting the wood, foraging for food, uh, who, who is tending the crops. And uh, this is going to um, really exacerbate the, um, the vulnerabilities. You have different patterns of mobility, you have different behavioural patterns. So why do, why do I take you through that? It's to, to, make a, to make a horrible point, really, and that is that when disaster strikes, we have the enough studies now to see that the mortality rate is very different as between women and men, and of course also for children and, and the elderly. And uh, this was uh, uh, some research from 2004, Tamil Nadu in India, and Obviously, the blue, the blue there on the left is the, there's a big peak for children, but if you look towards the age groups of 30, 30 to 54, you see that um, uh, more uh, uh, females than males uh, died in that, um, in that tsunami for all the sorts of reasons that I was just taking you through. So now we come to where our video is, which is the philosophy that we promote through our International Day and our work, and that is excluding women or not, not understanding and working actively to include women is an absolute lost opportunity because there are so many skills, capacities, the knowledge to deal with the seasonal floods, uh, the dry spills, the other hazards, the way in which um, uh, women manage the household resources, the family food, the water and security, um, food, water security, as caregivers uh, and as community workers in the in the uh, community, these are all vital resources that put us in the position to actually reduce the risks that we face uh, and to to manage when when a disaster happens. And there's a some of you mentioned that you, um, and using the phrase community resilience, which I like very, very much. Um, the, when we talk of resilience, if you think about what happens in a small community, in a, in a, in a village, in a, in a town, 
it's often the women who are holding that social fabric together, whether it's being talking with the neighbours over a, over standing in line for food or at a well or uh, in a church outside a mosque. I mean, wherever it happens to be, if you think about the role with the with the families and the, a lot of the <coughs> voluntary sector, it's often the women who are holding that social fabric together and that's the intangible that's so important in terms of the resilience. So there are just a couple of little um, vignettes in here of examples of women um, who who are um, in the, in the, who have been able to, I mean there's, there's just thousands and thousands of these examples, right? But I just put a couple in here that women as, as uh, natural resource managers, an example in the Pacific in the, um, of a uh, training program that has built a sustainable uh, planting scheme where the women are now able to grow crops that can um, adapt and grow quickly and provide the sustenance over the st after the storms. And why is this so important? It's because when we talk about disaster risk, people tend to think it's like the one in a hundred years. It's the huge earthquake that comes, wipes it out. It's not, actually. That, of course, is a disaster, like starting with the photo of the BAM earthquake. But the real problem is what we call the extensive risk. Every rainy season, rains come, wash away the crops, before you can do the next planting season, then the, then the next rainy season comes, or you're living with permanent drought. And so you imagine what that does to your community, to your economic livelihoods. So projects like these, which have a participatory pro approach where the women are actively working to try and change the type of um, planting and cropping arrangements so they have a much more sustainable approach and they can withstand. That is what we call a disaster risk reduction measure. Another one is, um, uh, this is a, um, a photo um, of women after the tsunami. It was an initiative to get the women involved because again, the mortality rate was so terrible, so many more women died than, than men. And this was a project to build women's resilience to disasters in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And uh, you can see the, the lady on the far right there, She's a, it's a trainer-trainer <coughs> scheme, where these women are actually, um, uh, despite the resistance uh, of their families and their men folk, they have been able to actively participate in and, com and uh, contribute to the community programs and have become the leaders uh, and the decision makers on their planning um, for the disaster risk reduction uh, measures. So they move from victims to actually uh, decision makers. And we're able to get the acceptance of their men folk and get the buy-in of their community to change that role. So it's quite a quite a powerful project. Now a little reminder because I'm actually um, we're actually in the business of the global system uh, uh, for risk reduction. There's an awful lot of treaties and agreements out there, okay? And in actual fact, uh, the need to be aware of gender in um, risk reduction has been entrenched in our governing um, international instruments since 1979 and uh, the Beijing um, platform in 1995 recognised that environmental degradation and disasters have a lot more direct impact on women and therefore there is this obligation, there's a duty to actually, for those of you that are working in this area, you have a duty to actually uh, be uh, accounting for uh, the gender perspective and what you do. And then we fast forward to 2005 and the Hyogo framework that I mentioned that came after the tsunami in 2004, where all the countries got together, made this international agreement, which we're all working to and reporting on, um, actually has a strong statement in it about the role of women. And it says, quote, a gender perspective should be integrated into all disaster risk management policies, plans, <coughs> processes, including those relating to risk assessment, early warning, information management, and education and training. Now, what does that mean? 
it's it's actually um, it's actually going well beyond recognizing the differences, and it's working towards a more equitable social and economic relationships between men and women. Uh, just take a just take a moment to look at the slide and see. It's a cliche, I know, but we're trying to have a more equitable relationship there. And there are many, many things that can be done uh, to actually make that happen. You, this little toolkit here that was produced is where I've taken a lot of this material from. And it's policy and practical guidelines that it was, came out quite some time ago and it's still being used in all the uh, country offices about how you actually develop early warning systems, how you do the risk assessments in a way to think of these gender uh, perspectives. For example, um, sudden onset of a hazard, a flood or a cyclone. I've mentioned before, there are, it's, it's the norm, unfortunately, that many girls just do not have the life-saving skills. So, and they may have a cultural prohibition on swimming. So do we take that into account when we're planning our evacuation procedures? Uh, there are many women who have to be accompanied by a male <coughs> relative or a companion in an evacuation. The, we, the, unfortunately, 1991 and the Bangladesh cyclone, the death toll um, was something like five to one um, more women. And there also have been uh, um, examples in the earthquake where uh, schoolgirls could not uh, leave the building and uh, died as a result because they could not go outside uh, the, school, the school premise without uh, being accompanied. So these are, um, these are difficult, difficult things which um, we have to think about when we, when we plan our policies and, uh, and whatever, the, whatever the, the culture or the region. And the slow onset of hazards such as drought and uh, desertification, uh, you have the number of households that are headed by women due to migration uh, by the men. The men have gone elsewhere to look for work. Maybe it's conflict that the, the men have, uh, have driven them away. But the, 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 the effect of that, of course, again, is um, the impact is felt so acutely by the women because they're their workload uh, increases. They are not only looking after the family, they are probably the only income earner in some shape or form if they're able to, uh, to earn. And uh, they're probably out there trying to secure the food, uh, the food supply. So a risk, risk assessments, which are part of the business of, of uh, being in a risk reduction, that's the methodology that you use to determine what is the, what is the nature and extent of the risk and so a gender sensitive risk identification and assessment would actually have to think about these sorts of things. If you are working in the area of early warning, for those of you that are here and working on flood management um, learning, to what extent are the warnings reaching women? Do the, do the women in the community know how to act on a warning? Uh, is, the, is the public information in a form that those who cannot read or write, can, can, have they got other ways of getting the information, like radio, if, if they're not able to, uh, if they are illiterate? And what about the mobility issue? How many women in a community are the ones who carry the children and the elderly? These are all the things that if you're planning an early warning system you, and uh, looking at the risk issues, you would think about. And then you've got these other deep-rooted, <coughs> deep-rooted gender considerations in terms of the lower levels of education and whether women can access the education, <coughs> which hampers their ability uh, to, to, to work with public information, uh, inequitable access to resources. It might be, you know, after a flood, um, can they access a market? Can they ac access credit? Can they access a relief service? All of that makes the recovery so much harder. Many women are ab totally dependent on agriculture for, for their jobs and their livelihoods. There's a, after the disaster, there's the cascade effect on feeding the family, on the household income. Um, very few women, they might manage the land, but they don't own the land, so there's a, a repercussion there. 
and there are plenty of studies showing the impact on reproductive health from, uh, from disasters and other uh, health uh, impacts for women. So all of these are the things that if we think, if we think that risk reduction is gender neutral, it's not. And the consequences of assuming that disaster risk is gender neutral is really quite far reaching. It means that when we try to identify the risks and assess the risk, we don't get it right. When we try to design the right policies, uh, the prioritizations and the financing at, at uh, these different levels, national and community, we don't get it right. Um, we, may may, we may have completely inappropriate interventions to try and minimize the risk and the vulnerability and increase the coping capacity. We might just be completely missing the target there. Communities are not going to be receptive or supportive of an intervention if, if it comes from an assumption that is completely divorced from the reality of the, of the community. And it's possible that the interventions uh, can really exacerbate existing inequalities and vulnerabilities. All right, so that's all um, a little negative, I agree. So. <laughs> So I mentioned you'd, we have the Hyogo framework, right? So, all right. And the Hyogo framework said in 2005, you've got to have a gender perspective. They had five indicators for each of the five pillars that I laid out there. So how are we doing? How are we doing? Um, to what extent are the early warning systems, the risk assessment, the policies, and the decision making uh, integrating gender perspective? Well, what we find when we go through um, and review all the reports that have come in since uh, 2005, we have 130 countries reporting okay, uh, on the HFA, is that the gender perspective is still largely excluded from the national policies and programs. We've had three biennial cycles of what we call this HFA monitor, that's our measuring tool, and the midterm review, and it shows that the inclusion of a gender perspective and effective community participation are the areas where the least progress has been made. Few governments consider gender as a driver of progress in their HFA implementation. Only 30% of the countries that were reporting, um, of countries reported a significant and ongoing engagement in uh, gender and, and DRR. And in fact, um, on this slide, the um, the blue are those countries that reported in the affirmative positively, and the red is where they were reporting that they haven't done much or, or anything. And it shows, yeah, there's some progress, but you see the red's pretty high there. So negative reporting by countries is overwhelming against the, all the, each one of these indicators down the bottom is for the different priorities and pillars of the, of the um, international agreement and uh, we're not doing very well. The, the governments are acknowledging the issue, but we've got miles to go. 62 out of 70 countries don't even bother to collect the gender disaggregated vulnerability and capacity information. We have national coordination mechanisms. Only 18% of those even have women included at that national level in the coordination machinery. Um, one of the findings is that came back to us in the reporting is that labelling women as vulnerable means they are automatically excluded from decision-making processes. It just, uh, once they get the, the label of vulnerable, there's an assumption by policy makers they have nothing to contribute. And uh, the women's organisations, are uh, there are so many and we work through them. Um, and they represent an untapped potential for implementing the, this HFA Hyogo framework in terms of the ideas and experience, and they're not being tapped. So we know we have these are this is not very profound. We know it, but we're going to have to push much harder. We have to recognise women as a resource, not the victims of disasters, but the resource. We have to find a way to make that resource work for all of us, the whole society, strengthen the capacities to contribute. The women, we have to find a way that in each of the communities the women are, are leading, are being engaged. We have to provide the opportunities, the spaces for that to happen. And it can be done in quite a systematic way, actually, in a grassroots way. Um, and empower the women to take charge. So we are negotiating a new agreement now, which we hope will go the next 
25 years. When I say we, I mean all the countries are negotiating this. Here's the, the timeline. The, the, big, the big summit will be March, Japan, 2015. And this will actually um, determine what happens going forward on risk reduction for the next 25 years, we hope. And we have been engaging in a global consultation process from the, the, the local level and community level through to uh, the global level. And the message from the consultation is that the next international agreement, the HFA2, has to provide clear entry points for women's leadership everywhere in dealing with both climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction because it's self-destructive to exclude or diminish opportunities for women to contribute their particular perspectives and expertise. And we have this global gathering which was in May last year. 3,500 practitioners came. I don't know if any of you were there. Um, and we had 172 countries, 265 NGOs, community bodies, 200 mayors. We had scientists, businesses. And they, one of the issues they were looking at were women as leaders in risk reduction. And again, they were saying women have to be enabled to take on the leadership roles. You've got to make space for this to happen. We have to make sure that the treaties, and there are so many treaties, I only gave you a few, uh, are being picked up and that the legislation on women's rights that's been agreed on, agreed upon by everybody is actually brought into these practices. The accountability issue, there's a lot of interest in accountabilities, so we have to ensure that the gender inclusion has the right data and the right analysis available. Um, we, we have to ensure that there are other processes are also picking this up. You'll be aware that the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, expire in 2015, so there's a parallel process to develop SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. I don't come up with these acronyms, okay? Um, and um, risk reduction is actually about development. It's about development processes and how we build our towns, how we build our bridges, how we do our supply chains, um, uh, how we approach the whole issue of resilience at our community levels. And we have to make sure that in this, what they call the post-2015 development agenda, um, which is going to be around sustainable development, that this linkage is made. And we have to absolutely ensure that in the reporting system, um, which will be the monitoring system, that this is writ large in there. Because what we want to do is we want to move from this... from this to this. And this, this slide here is of the women who were actually, again, um, it was a um, risk assessment, um, it was a risk mapping exercise. It was an action aid workshop on building capacities and risk reduction. And these women are actually doing the risk mapping for their community and they are looking at what the capacities exist in their community and what can be done about it and about taking charge. And I know it's, I know I've emphasized, and I've shown the pictures of the women, but it's actually not a women's issue. You can't work on this issue unless you're working together in a very coherent way and it's a societal issue. It's in everybody's interest. Save lives, livelihoods, economic loss, the quality of our lives, the quality of our communities. So that's what we are doing and where I know it's I know it's really the global level is not as fun and inspiring as the speakers who came before, but it's um, incredibly important. You can all be part of this because the consultation processes that we do, particularly out in the regions, goes right down to the grassroots and we are trying to bring um, the voices uh, to bear on this, and so there are many, many things uh, that you could be uh, you could be contributing your views. And if you're going to become flood water um, experts back in your countries, 
Um, just push this. Just push this, please. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Elizabeth, for your insightful uh, presentation. Actually, from it, uh, I could say some of us were presenting our thesis in a month's time. Could borrow a leaf for now to present information without beating so much around the bush. <laughs> so that was nice. Uh, I'm sure from the audience uh, we have a couple of questions for Ms. Longworth. Who goes first? Yes. Hold up to your mouth, Chloe. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your very powerful uh, presentation. It was really interesting. But I think that uh, well, from all three presentations, what I find is that uh, we, f we tend to not forget, but not to mention, that as women, we have husbands. And like you were saying at the end of the day, that uh, in some countries, the girl children do not go out of school because they needed a male person to actually escort them outside. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that is one other point that we need to really emphasize on. Because most of our problems, what I kind of figure out from all the presentations, is that the, the root of a woman's problem is not the woman itself. But we are capable of being leaders, we are capable of doing all these things that you say we can do. But our problem is the permission or being allowed to by the men that are in our lives or by the societal uh, that is actually dominated by men rule. This is what the men say and this is what is going to go. And secondly, I think that uh, when you're talking about gender inequality or gender that, uh, we kind of really hiding the fact that it's not really gender in inequality, it's, we should just say woman we tend to like kind of beat around the bush. The women are not equal to men, finish. And I think that is what we should be kind of striving to kind of change. And whenever we're talking about gender issues, we should just say women issues. Because I think even if we do have men issues out there, maybe they're not as, as bad as we have it. I don't know, <laughs> I've never been a man. <laughs> and then, uh, I think the other thing is, um, when you're talking about women issues, I always find that uh, if it's women abuse, women of violence, we're always talking about uh, these things to women. I mean, I think it's time to kind of change our target market. If you were advertising something, if you're advertising makeup, you're actually targeting women. But if you're advertising gender violence or women violence, are you also advertising that to women? I mean, it does not make any sense to me. I think we should kind of change our target market. So when we're talking about women problems, I feel maybe we should really be talking to men because they are the real foundation and root of our problems. So I think maybe uh, if we are organizing women empowerment like now, I think 100% should be men. And then maybe the 50%, 150% sort of should be then the, the woman. Because we are living this. We are the real part of it. So if you're saying a woman should be empowered, yes, it's okay. But I do not have more or less the power to empower myself if I have got a husband, I need permission from my uncle. So I believe that you should be knocking in the house of that uncle to say, can I please talk to your daughter? Sort of. Something like that, thank you. I would spoil that if I comment on it. <laughs> Sister. <laughs> well, can I be provocative, though, on something that I think I could comment on? Of course it's women, not gender. Um, there are some issues where it's gender, like if you're looking at uh, performance in schools, Actually, there are issues with boys, there are issues with girls. So depending on, your, on, the, on the circumstance, but in the context that we're talking about, yes, 
and that's why I'm not beating around the bush, thank you for that phrase. Um, uh, we are talking about women and girls. And I relate to what you're saying. Um, in my culture, in the 1970s, now I'm, eight, I'm dating myself, I know. Um, you know, we fought this good fight. Uh, and in so many countries of the world, it's, not, it's, it's only beginning. But I'm also terribly conscious because of the, the where I'm working and how we're working that it is self-defeating to 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 um, not if you don't bring the whole community along with you and show the the shared value in it. And uh, there is enough um, there are enough studies now to show the 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 uh, the economic wealth that comes from having well-educated women uh, who educate their girls and the growing wealth of the family and by family I mean the the, the fathers and the brothers and the whole you know there's a there's an inter interdependency here that I think we sell ourselves short if we if we only focus on this narrow narrow area but I uh, in terms of the activism I would certainly agree I think it is for women to organize themselves and to to figure out where they're going to focus and how they're going to target, but it does. You do find that there are. Um, uh, you have to make a broader argument in the end about the benefit to your society as a whole, men, women, the wider society. But I, I, uh, I loved all your comments and I thank you for that. Mm. Anybody else? It's a hard act to follow that one, wasn't it? <laughs> but there is some interesting uh, over here. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And I, um, I'm also still concerned about the uh, women empowerment and um, in disaster risk, risk reduction. Um, sometimes we try to uh, introduce new things to women, but neglecting that so many of these women have local, local uh, power, that they have local knowledges that we could improve instead of um, introducing new things. Some of them, when, when in, in, in some of those that are in the areas where there are flooding, you see they have local knowledge on which they use to prevent these uh, disasters. They have knowledge, local knowledge. So instead of just um, 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 dwelling on introducing new, new practices or education, we could harness this local knowledge that they have and improve it and thereby helping them, you know, um, overcome some of the challenges they have. Hmm. Um, you are completely right. And uh, one of the, ex uh, the examples I had, which I, in the interest of time, I didn't go into, but we've got examples, um, examples of women who have been working the land, having a unique knowledge of the islands in which they live in Micronesia, Micronesia so which enabled them to actually um, locate water sources, which then led to the building of wells, um, there are um, many other examples of uh, traditional knowledge uh, and resource knowledge um, being used for adaptation and cropping, quite apart from sort of interventions like the little the, the project that I showed you from the Pacific. Uh, you've got women um, understanding how to build clay ovens, how to raise the, level, the, le the floor level of their housing, uh, supervising construction techniques uh, in their village, um, there, that, that's the point, isn't it, what you were saying? There's a wealth of knowledge out there and that should be tapped. And what, what I'm trying to say is there's a system out there that has a duty to tap it. And we need to make sure that when we, we build this next international framework, um, you know, we, 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 are, um, we are really accelerating where we've from where we've travelled from. We need to really make a quantum leap now and uh, systematise uh, th these knowledge sources. And every plan, every strategy, and every local government should have a strong um, female participation along with their male counterparts. Thank you. Probably one last question before we take a break. Thank you very much. So why do you really think that despite all evidence, yeah. the international community doesn't do what it promises, doesn't deliver on its promises? 
And why do national governments, who should know so much better, uh, why don't they deliver on promises? I mean, what is it that we are, don't seem to, able, to be able to really learn? Um, I think there's probably a room full of experts here who will have a view on that, and it's a, it's because it's the question we ask ourselves all the time, isn't it? Um, is it about power? Is it about uh, deep-rooted social constructs? Is it because we haven't explained the economic benefit, because at the end of the day there's a self-interest for, for most people and communities? Um, uh, is it because it's not enforced if it's a duty or a treaty? Uh, I mean, if a legal, a legal obligation? Um, is it lack of awareness? I mean, this is what, you know, we have a monitoring tool now where, where those countries that are reporting, it is a self-reporting tool, but at least we move from nothing to actually having 130 countries exposed to this reporting. And at the local government level, the same thing will happen with our um, local government uh, reporting tool. Uh, but there's a lack of accountability somehow, isn't there? And uh, that's why in these discussions to craft the next <coughs> international agreement, there's such a hot interest in accountability right across the board, not, not, not just on, on the gender issue. So I, 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 would be, I would be curious to know, I think there, we speculate forever on this. Mm. It's a mix of all of these things, I think. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Sure, sure. I think uh, they're about it. Maybe calling it. Uh, we've we've scared the men. <laughs> <laughs> well, no males, no men want to ask a question. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, thank you well, for your presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Uh, so far, so good uh, with our discussions for the afternoon. Uh, right about now, we'll be taking a break for 30 minutes. It's a coffee break. Uh, coffee will be served uh, on the foyer. And uh, for those who need the services of the washrooms, there's one upstairs and there's another one downstairs. Yep. Uh, just outside the foyer still. So we still have some more uh, distinguished speakers when we are back. So let's see you after 30 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second session for our discussions today. I hope uh, the coffee has been refreshing enough and so the fresh air outside. Next, we would like to welcome our presenter uh, from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is one of the largest private foundations in the world founded by Bill and Melinda Gates. It is uh, driven by the interests and passions of the Gates family. The primary aims of the foundations are globally to enhance healthcare and reduce extreme poverty. And in America itself, 
they focus on expanding educational opportunity and access to information technology. The foundation has its offices in Seattle, Washington, and is controlled by three trustees. I'm sure you're familiar with these names, Bill Gates, Melinda Gates, and Warren Buffett. Now to our speaker, to our presenter, Dr. Valerie Nkamgang Bemo. I hope I pronounced the middle one right. Uh, she is the senior program officer responsible for the emergency response portfolio and the senior regional advisor for West Africa within the agricultural development portfolio. Dr. Bemo has 10 years of experience in clinical and public health worldwide. And before joining the foundation, she held various roles at the International Rescue Committee, most recently serving as Senior Technical Advisor for Health in the Democratic Republic of Congo and West Africa. Dr. Bemo has also worked with various NGOs and has had extensive involvement in the Ache Indonesia, Cote d'Ivoire, Sierra Leone, Mauritania, Kenya, and Chad. She's a board member of the Global Health Council. Help me, join me in welcoming Dr. Bemo uh, to present. It took me many, many weeks to think about what I want to talk about. And asking me about the practice, and gender is women and men. And unless we start really thinking about that way, we think any exclusion starts by creating a problem then let us see how to be inclusive. My grandmother. I'm in a place uh, that where it's uh, really polygamous. Because everybody knew the, the children or the grandchildren around the house know if you want really something to happen. That, for me, is the power. Because we tend to see the power about, like Margaret Ch uh, Thatcher said, the people who you want people to, to, to you go to men if you want them to say something, but if you want to go to do something, go to the woman. And this is my class matter than do that. And I think that is the lesson for me when we talk about gender. What is it about? And when I say we have to be, we are in, instead of the BMW um, four horses, it's a Toyota four cows. <laughs> and the photo is the, and uh, trying to translate it to understand the, the social norm. The knowledge, you have to trust the local knowledge. They know better than us. They, they are, it's not because you're an emergency, it's not because you are poor, that you have no brain, you have no dignity, and you are not smart. And I think that is the other mistake we are doing. We have to trust their knowledge, we have to trust that they're smart enough, that they, 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 they like each other, that they, are, they have their dignity, and that, they, they, they make it happen. Somebody was saying the other day, um, the system is not broken. No system is broken. It's your perspective who see it broken. But all the system, even the more chaotic from outside, is working for that system. It's maybe not the way we want it to work. But you have to, to try to understand and trust the local knowledge. And the other one is that use the existing. Use what it is there, use the people, use the knowledge, and try start from there. And I like the, the lady earlier who was saying, we want to approach and bring things, but let us start with what is existing. And I think one of the things, you have to be creative. And there's no one solution fit all them. You have to understand the norm, you have to l understand the local knowledge, you have to use the existing, and just be creative. Just get there and try, but trust the people locally. And I think for me this is the real, but which people? Because I think we go and we trust the first person who speak louder, or who show up in front. That is the people we think we trust. But actually it's not usually the people that everybody trusts. And I think that is another, issues that we have to take it in account. And continuing, I think we, I will not go there because I think from UNSC, uh, from uh, the disaster risk management, we talk a lot about the rapidly changing and it's, it's almost like the world is coming upside down. But I think it's not necessary 
due to the climate change or only. It's about how we behave and the, the rapidly changing nature of the society, the rapid changing nature of the technology, the communication, we, on, we are have more information and the, the population, we grow in more urban, we start doing things that we were not doing before, we have less respect for the nature, etc, etc. But I don't want to go because I had a lot of special news talk about disaster. And also the emergency context. And I think when we come back to, initially I was talking just about communities, reality, but I want to come back to an emergency setting. We tend to see, it's easy when you see from, you know, from BBC or CNN, the number of, um, or my, my sister there was talking about, uh, um, yeah, with uh, Bofa or with Washi, there was this number of people there, there was this. It's so easy to, but what we don't realize is about your human being is a brother, is a sister, is a mom. And this is more powerful. Like she said, I heard about it, but when I, I saw somebody who, the, the body on the, on, the, on the road, when I see people who just come and the number of stories you have for people who said, oh, I'm so glad, I'm so lucky, and you go in the refugee camp, and you see this person who is like, oh, God loved me so much, and one of the more um, happier people and the more lucky people, and you look at him and he's like, He's under a tent, and you're like, okay, how come? He said, you know, I have a place to sleep, I have a roof, and actually, none of my family dead. I have my, my, all my family with me. This is what is important. And actually, I'm so lucky. And I think we take different things in perspective. And I think this is important to understand that the, the, the loss, the human being lost, is more powerful than anything. The destruction of home. I didn't put, because we look at destruction of house, I'm talking about destruction of home. And the destruction of home sometimes is more powerful. Usually um, at the foundation, when I have somebody who asks me, what are you doing, what is emer emergency, and things like that, the first, one, the first way I ask them, I say, okay, let us do a scenario. Today they call you and say, yeah, your house are burned, and that's it, what do you do? What is the first thing you do? And I, I take them through that journey to understand. They say, oh, the photo of my grandmother, oh, my son. You know, these are the things, because we usually see the house, but not the home. And the home is more powerful. And when people, and I think when we are talking about with UNSC, when people go to a camp, it's not just about the tent, because we tend to see the shelter, but how do we give them a home? And this is another big, powerful thing. The social network and the social power. This, the, like when you look at the, we were talking about gender, gender-based violence, it's increasing emergency, the protection issues. Usually it's because you don't have the protective services. In the village, like where I grew up, where I born, it's not just about my parents to take care of me. It's the neighbor, it's the uncle, it's the family, it's the aunt, it's all that. With the disruption of the emergency, you lose that, so that the, the small girl is more in danger because the brother don't have time, and this is what it is. The market disruption, we don't emphasize enough the, the, the business model, the loss of asset, the health issue, the basic need, political and military, protection and livelihood. I just wanted to, to, for us to start looking at emergency differently from the numbers, but it's people. It's one people, it's one house, it's one home, it's a relationship, you lost your network. And that is really what is important. Um, I want to, to come back to look at the, from the field, based on all the, what is an emergency, what I learned from my experience, from my family, from where I'm coming from, and what are some of the key elements we have to take in account. In emergency, we just, we really struggle all the time. One of the big struggles is like, how do we communicate? How do we have the dollars? It's an emergency setting, we have no time, we have to do it fast, people die. It's constantly the struggle and the juggling between all that different um, issues. But the three things that I want to really emphasize, the power dynamic is key. 
the role of responsibility, the struggle and the constraints. Um, for the power dynamic, I want to come back to, you have the, the switch, you have the power. When we talk about power, you can't do the power with just one. And when we look at this, um, who is the one, who is, how do you do the power with that one and another? And you have to understand who is the one who is the, who have to press the switch, who is the one who have the, 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 the you know, the power, the, the, the outlet, it's all that. It's not about just the one who put the switch because th sometimes it's the only one we see. Oh, you want the light? The person who press the light is the one, but you have all the other dynamic. And unless you understand that, actually you don't get the point and you cannot solve and you cannot even address the women issues in that community unless you understand that power dynamic. Um, these two pictures, um, these are the two, these are two groups really powerful in different countries. The man is, um, is in Mali, in the Dogon country, where is the elders, when there's anything, these are the people who actually will make life and death decision, who's doing what and things like that. And they are, he's so powerful, but it's a visible power. It's really the visible power. In the, the women's there, these are elders, this is in Kenya. It's elders in the community who are, actually, they are invisible power, but they are so powerful. Nothing in that community will happen if they are not giving their blessing. If they are not saying the year, if people will go and consult them before it's happening in the past, but they are not as visible as the other man who is actually standing in front. It's different countries, different power, but it's the elders. Always, and I think in a lot of the communities, the elders have the power. And how do you use, I took the example of my grandmother, I take the example of my grandfather, but it's some important. But the power dynamic, I think we have to understand what are the social economic factors that are embedded in it. Who has who bring the money? Has the money is getting? What? Who is doing what? Who has uh, what power? Um, the religion plays. What religion? What's the role of the religion? This is more important and more crucial than we think. In the lot of community, if you go, uh, the religion. We take the Muslim, the Christian. We take even the Buddhists and the, the Hindu, all of that, and even some of our tra um, traditional African religion, so powerful. And sometimes you go and you want to do anything, and they say yes, 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 yes. In the back, they come and they go and celebrate the God, and they do that thing, and they say, oh yeah, we thought about it, but nothing is happening. And you don't understand. Somebody in the night having some power there, and changing the rules. No matter how much you come and everybody agree, in the night something happened. And I think unless you, you, you start putting the, the nail, nail on it, you will not know. Who make the decision? Who ultimately have the power decision? And I remember she was saying that I have an uncle, I have a father, I have a husband. Is it the husband making the, the decision? Few, few years ago, I had a project. It was in the Cote d'Ivoire with the crisis and we were doing the, some reproductive health project. We wanted women to go and deliver the health facilities. We did everything and it was just not happening. Then I said, maybe we have to change. And I started really understanding who, ha how is it happening in that community? In the, you realize that the mother-in-law will decide how the, the woman will deliver if she's a TBA and the husband will give the money. But all the session we had was to the pregnant woman. All the session was the pregnant woman. I say, there yeah, are you say, and you talk to her, you say, but you say you will do that. Why you didn't do that? She said, I know, but at the moment where I'm getting in labor, I'm not the one who, who make the decision. I have no power at that moment. Then we shift, we start talking to the husbands and we start talking to the mother-in-law when we go to the house. Believe me or not, the number of people going to the health facility increase. And we talk to the TBA, 
the traditional bird attendant who is doing the delivery and try to link her with the health facilities. We have an increase of delivery. And the husband himself, we empower him like, you know, it's your wife. Imagine she's not there. You'll be not having a wife. You'll be the thing. Look at her. This will save her. You know, we start really going to them. They were the ones saying, it's your time to go to the prenatal and then say, take the money, go. You don't stay here. Like, wow. She was like, they put us more pressure now to do that. But it's because he understood. And he's the one who makes the decision. Unless you do your program thinking about, it's not so much about the woman who deliver, it's about who make decision and how the decision have taken. And if you understand that, actually you can have a lot more impact in what you are doing and you can actually make more, you talk to the men, but you actually have an impact on the woman based on how you, you, you play with that power. Who has influence? I think this is another, the same example, the TBAs, the traditional bird attendants, are so powerful in the community, in the village. They, are, they, they were just like, they are the ones who have delivered two, two or three kids and the three, four, then people trust her. If she, we, put, we took her and we put her linked with the health facilities, when she was sitting there at the health facility, the, the men and the mother-in-law were more comfortable sending the woman there because the TBA was there. She has influence. We use her to, because it was not just the men decision, but it was the, the, the TBA who has the influence. And these are really important. You have to understand what's the influence. Is it the religion leaders? Is it the old eldest ladies there? If it's there, the power, and they have influence, pass through them. Like I was talking about my grandmother. When you want to have something, you know if you go to my grandfather, I will not pass. Then you go through her, and you make your case. If she believes your case is good, I don't know what's happened, I don't know how she made it, but at the end, it's passed. But you have to pass through her. She has influence, but she's not making the last decision, but she has influence. And who is trusted? Again, coming back, the traditional birth attendants in that village were the trusted person. If she says something, they will do it. They use them. Use that if you want to have really influence. Then I'm coming back to some of these pictures because the importance of culture and religion, I'm coming back to that again. Um, the photos of the men, these are in a village in Niger. These men, there's no even way the woman will come and stand and speak. And I remember we were with uh, one of our colleagues who's from it's an African, but it's in the US now, and we were there, and I start asking questions about why the women are not talking. Or th they were answering nicely and things with me. When he spoke, and we say, why are not happening? Oh my goodness, they got, was hard on him. They're like, you as a man, how can you dare even talking about it like that? Your wife already washed you up. Your wife already killed. You are lost. Um, we are pitiful. He was so sad for him. And he was like, oh my goodness. But these guys will let me speak as much as I speak because I'm the donor, I'm the giver. They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. But actually nothing happened. I'm the, just a woman. No matter how much power, how much intellectual, I have to know how to behave myself. And then the other picture, the one in the middle on the top, how many times have you gone to, to meetings and the people in front are men and the women are in the back there? This is so familiar. I have tons of meetings. Sometimes, even you are lucky if they are even sitting. They're usually somewhere aside. And we tend to say, why we bring the women? But you put them in comfortable. The women are uncomfortable, the men are, are unhappy. Then actually everybody's unhappy. Then just don't force something. Play with it and try to find a way to talk to the women separately, but don't try to force in front of any, every place because you'll be going in a problem. And the ladies behind with the, the child, I like that because she's, this is was Asta after Sida in Bangladesh and uh, the, the, the black dot there is for protection. She believes 
that is it. And they call the child the Sada, Sida, because they say he born in the, the day of the, the cyclone, that night. And, but they, they need to protect her. And they said now that he has that black um, on the head, he's protected, especially because he survived the Sida. And no matter what you do, she believes really strongly on that. Then don't say it's not true, because then she will not even listen to you. How do you deal with that? If she, you want to, her to do something differently or more impo important, how do you deal with that? And I think that is an important. The woman in the middle, I like her because I, um, we were doing a cash for work program in Ethiopia. And then, of course, the money is going to the woman so that they think. And then I asked her, I said, there were two or three women, and I said, how did you use the money? And she said, okay, I put 100, 20 percent I buy for food, this for goods, and this, this, this. But actually, I gave hundreds to, to my husband. I like, why? They said, so that he can go and have his drink and his thing, and he leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> they are smart. This is a smart way, but actually for us, we were like, what? You gave them money? It's for the family. She said, this is my way to be in peace. And he leave me alone, and I can do the rest with it. I gave him money for his cigarette and his drink. And for me, this is, and they start laughing, of course. They, they were laughing, we were joking, we have fun. But this is her decision, and I think this is smart. She know how to maneuver, but she ach achieved what she have to do. And of course, the other one is like, in the, this is in Mali, in the Dogon country, and when they, this dance, this mask, I was there, and they say, I cannot stand there. I say, why? I say, you are a woman. You have to sit back, because you cannot stand in front of the mask. You are a woman, no matter, I and they were doing the ceremony for me. <laughs> <laughs> they were doing the dancing because I was coming, but I couldn't s sit in the front row. I have to be in the back because I should not be too close to the mask. And no matter how much I, I can do, I have to respect that because this is what it is. And if I want them to listen, and after we become good partner because they know I trust and I listen to their judgment and their knowledge and I respect their culture. Unless you do that, you will not achieve the woman's serving. Um, role and responsibility. I just put and say that, and I think we discussed it before, it's important to acknowledge that the woman will not go and dig and build the house. The woman will flush the water and she'll cook and she'll take care of the kids. And I think it's important to not try to have the woman do everything because actually we overwhelm them. We give them too much usually. And we usually try to have them do everything. This is not good. They are already overwhelmed. They are already working from 8 to, to 8 p.m., 8 the morning to 8 p.m. And we include them, wanted to be in all meetings, wanted to be in everything, and they are struggling. Even if you want to do a woman-centric, um, we have to find a way to accommodate them and not for them to accommodate us because they already have a lot on their plate. How do we make sure that we accommodate them? If you have to do the meeting, don't do that in the morning, please because they're supposed to go and take the water, take the food, do that in the moment where they're a bit less busy. Because then you can have some women interacting. And, and I think that is some of the other stuff we are doing from the field, a lot of small mistakes, but let us make sure that we, we included them. And then what time we want to do that? And what is the alternative? If they cannot come when we, because usually we have training program, it's never in the village. The training program is, they have to work 10 hours, it's in another place, they have to sleep somewhere else. How do they do that? They will not. They will have to come, the husband will not let them go, they will have to come with somebody to come there, they will have to leave the children. It's so complex, how do we do alternative? How do we make in a woman friendly program? Because that is what it is. And if we start asking them too much, I like this octopus because at the end, I'm not sure how, what music he can do. <laughs> if we have so many instruments trying to play each of them at the same time, there's no way he can give you a music. 
You need different people to hold different instruments, not the same person holding all the orchestra instruments, because it will be a cacophony, or no sound will come, actually. Um, the one I want to come to the struggle and the constraint, and we have to understand that in an emergency, everybody suffered, men, women, boy, but we tend to focus, of course, the women suffer more, of course, but we do have to acknowledge the issues that the men also suffered. Because if we don't acknowledge it, we, like usually, um, of, um, earlier she was talking about the dignity. They are supposed to be, and I'm coming back to say, he, the men, he's supposed to be the provider. That is the, is for him, he knows he's a provider. I'm supposed to provide for my family. He, don't, he lost it. He lost the asset. He lost the job. He lost whatever it is. He's supposed to be the, he's the pride. Sometimes he lost that pride. The livelihood, the financial. And we, we tend to look at him and say, oh, he's the man. Then he's so in power. Let us focus on the woman. Yes, but if this man lost his dignity and his pride, he will be even more harsh with the woman. He will be less respectful. He will, he will be more hard on her than, than, than before. Because sometimes the women are more, like we said, they, they are smarter and they find their way. They are more resilient, smarter. They'll find their way. The men will have more difficulty on finding their way on getting their life, or the woman will get back quicker. Then the guys who, and the NGO will come and try to give everything to the woman. Then suddenly, there's a power change in the, in the household. He cannot bring any money, and it's the woman who brings everything. This is difficult for him. He's pride. And how do we give him back his dignity? Because then he, he can support the woman. Unless we, we understand that, we will have a problem. Um, the woman, she has so many things that she has to deal with. The kid, the food, the basic needs, and the maternal issue, because actually in addition, she has the maternal issue. She's pregnant, a lot, I remember one of the programs, we saw a woman, and she was so mad. And I said, what's happening? She said, you know, the floods happened, the cyclone happened, I lost everything, and I lost my pill, my, my contraceptive pill. And of course, nobody, it's not the first thing that you come on. You can't, don't come, oh, take, you lost everything. Take the water, take the food, and take your pills. Contraceptive. <laughs> it's not working that way. And on, of course, it's not something that is so, because usually they have it in the health facilities, not something that is public, and things like that. And this woman was so mad because she said, first, I lost everything. Now I got pregnant where I knew I didn't want to be. I have to I have two or three trauma. But we don't think about that because she will have to take the breastfeeding, the build her house, and some of this adds. That's why I put two of the women because it adds a, a dimension from just the livelihood loss or the financial loss. That all what is in the men can be there, but you add that other dimension. And one thing that we don't think enough, and I I like bringing that, the the boys. Actually. Sometimes I even pity them, the adolescent doll boys, or when people live in the camp. I saw we were talking about Dadab. In Dadab is you have some 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 small boy who arrived in the camp where they were five years old. These are 25 years old now, or 30 years old. They don't know anything else than the camp. This is where they grow up. This is where they are, and. They are lost, and they have to be pride. They have to be having a wife and having, the, but they never know even how to earn money, and this is difficult for them. They they have to think about my future when you don't even see a future. You're in the camp, you don't know what will happen. You never learn anything, and you have to think about the future. What job I can have if everything is lost? The military, that's why we have the military. They have a lot more demand for military on this small boy. The family, they want to create a family. They need to have a, a family. And of course, they are teenagers, they are boys. They need sex. It's hard. 
for them. And there's not a social protection around. Then of course, there will be drama around. And the small girl, just for you, this is in <laughs> Dakloban a month ago. <laughs> um, the, the same, the future, but they need protection. In the normal environment, the, the, the girl first, they become teenagers, they also have like the hormones going on, they start showing up, but they are more protected when it's a normal environment. They will have always a brother, a mom, to make sure where they are going. When they are in disaster where you can't even control anywhere, they are more at risk. Protection, the sanitation, we're talking about sanitation, where the small girl is going. How she has not even learned how to, to deal with their, her periods, and then she has to go in public to deal with that. That is still a, a bad thing for her. And she's still trying to deal with that, but she don't know. How do we do that? Education, um, sex, pregnancy, and family. But I think one of the things is that we have to keep them as a kid. That is important. How do we keep this boy and, and girl as a kid? And I think it's important. And to close, I want to come back to another story from my family. I'm lucky to have um, my, to, uh, to have been educated because I have a family. Um, my father and my mom believe in education. Um, I remember when my mom, um, got education because she came from a grandfather who was believing in that and she got education but my father was happy for her to have education but he didn't want her to work and she had to struggle she had to go to a lot of uncle people friends of him to convince him but he gave a lot of rules but at the end she was a model for us and i'm here where i am not because necessarily, okay, my mother was really important. She was a model. I saw her struggling with my father and showed that she can be a household, a housewoman, but she can work also. And she was so working three, four, five times more, but to, make, to please him so that she can work. But actually, the more important, and I think we don't emphasize this enough, is that my father was critical for me where I am now because he believed in it and he protect us and he <laughs> stopped anybody who wanted to discourage to say what this girl she already did a lot enough education she should get married and things like that and he has a protection because my mom alone could not have protected and i think that is where i'm coming back to the gender and the men issues because because i have my father i could get where i am also because he believe in it he pay for that he pushed for that, he stopped everybody, uncle, family, who wanted to come and marry. A lot of them went and say, oh, I want to marry your, uh, your, your daughter. He looked at him and said, have you talked to her? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> he said, it's her. Uh, she's educated for that. Go and talk to her. And they know they cannot come to me. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that is the story, and I think for me, we have to consider the men if you are talking about gender and women. If you want to help the women, we have to consider that they are part of a, a, a society, and that is it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Valerie, for your speech. It's really, really informative and very inspiring. And if I am to say one sentence hearing your speech, you are successful and you are what you are now because of your strong family foundation. Uh, um, because we're running out of time, uh, we will entertain the question after the next speaker. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. I can just hold on. Uh, we're not so far from closing. Allow me to quickly and briefly introduce the next speaker. It's a joint between uh, Fiona Zakaria and Professor uh, Damir. Uh, Fiona Zakaria is a PhD fellow in UNESCO IHE. Uh, she has worked uh, previously as a watch specialist uh, in, under UNICEF in schools and communities in Indonesia and Sudan. That was until 2011. She's also uh, worked as a water habitat field engineer with the International Committee Red Cross, that is ICRC. Uh, 
She has two masters, one in sanitary environmental engineering from the University of Putra, Malaysia, and also one from uh, water science and policy management from the University of Oxford in the UK. Professor Damir Janovic uh, the staff of the IHG, his, his professional mission is to contribute to the knowledge and development, research and capacity building in the urban sanitation field. Uh, he started his professional career in 1988 in Yugoslavia as a graduate of University of Sarajevo. And in the 90s, he worked for large consultancy firms in the UK and the Netherlands and started his academic career in 2002 at the UNESCO IHG in Delft. He has also worked in more than 30 countries and managed a number of large and complex engineering projects, education projects and advisory assignments, often multidisciplinary in nature and involving conflicting interests. But I can't fail to not to mention this. He's also proved uh, his capability in the acquisition of large project and research funds just to mention the latest flagship project that is stimulating local innovation in sanitation for sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. Uh, it received a grant of uh, 8 million US dollars provided by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I would like to take this chance to welcome Fiona and Professor Damir to make their presentation. It's very difficult to give a last speech, and after such inspiring speeches before, and especially when you talk about engineering and research, coming after uh, all these uh, beautiful presentations and I inspiring speeches, and being the only man in the program <laughs> with a <laughs> with a <laughs> with a <laughs> with a uh, yes, uh, who could give uh, now. Right, so uh, I want to show you a small fraction of our work that we do at UNESCO IAG, uh, and that's a really small fraction. Uh, uh, it is about uh, sanitation, and we do lots of other work on emergencies in, in different areas, but uh, today we have only one spot, and uh, it was decided that uh, it is about a, an example from UNESCO IAG. Um, it's linked to the, to the project that was just mentioned, and um, it is um, something that... Uh, we used really opportunity encouraged by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to think outside of the box and to go into unexplored areas. And uh, we will share some of our results uh, uh, that are just uh, very fresh and very hot. Um, and I hope that uh, we will get some useful feedback from you at the end. Um, it is about uh, sanitation in emergencies and especially for all so it's inclusive it's all also for women and and for men and for children and for young and for the old injured uh, and so on um, it is um, a called emergency sanitation operation system that's uh, our name that we gave it to it and i will give you some um, information about that within the project uh, that I, I just mentioned we have number of research areas that we agreed with the, with, the, with the foundation and one of them is on emergency sanitation. At the moment that we, when we signed the contract and uh, developed the research agenda, I was not really sure what we will research under emergency sanitation. It's a five, six year uh, program and what helped us that uh, last year uh, in Delft we organized uh, a big workshop with uh, 200 uh, people from all uh, 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 leaks of, of uh, emergencies from academia, from uh, emergency providers, relief agencies, manufacturers of emergency equipment, uh, the uh, governments, uh, municipalities, everybody was there. And we learned a lot. We learned a lot during these uh, three days. And then we decided to create something which will really uh, 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 address the gaps that the, the practice showed. It's not an uh, idea of some research group who wants to do something and has uh, some money to do it. No, it's just really demand-driven. 
And um, this is the, the, the group which is really working on emergency sanitation within our projects. And we have about uh, 120 people involved in the project actively. And uh, the project contains about 130 <coughs> many years of research. And we expect lots of innovations and lots of outputs. And today we only focus on one of them. Um, we uh, developed something called, as I said, ESOS system. And from this workshop that we had here, we realized that there are many issues in the whole sanitation chain under emergency situations. Uh, coming from the collection, storage of, of excreta, so urine and feces, uh, extraction, transport, treatment and reuse. Everywhere we found the problems. And uh, we developed a concept which is really, at the moment, using high-tech technologies which are around us, laying untapped under the emergency situations. And we put many of these technologies together and we added some of our own uh, inspiration into it and created this system. It's really um, uh, based on, on even a prevention stage where we uh, can do something even before the uh, emergency strikes. Uh, but it is also very much focused on uh, immediate phase after emergency happens. So this is within a couple of first weeks. Then the medium phase, which is a couple of uh, weeks. And then with longer term phase, which can last for several years. And we focus on several components of it. One component is uh, emergency toilet. Uh, that's a focus of our presentation today. But also a uh, focus uh, of our research is on the treatment. We are developing very innovative treatment of urine and feces, after which we will have um, a very safe uh, disposal uh, of material and uh, clean water. Um, there we are pairing uh, very likely with, uh, with, uh, with uh, partners like Royal Hasconing, DHV. And today's presentation, we are pairing with the partners like uh, Flex Innovation Lab, and the, their representatives are present here, and the SysTech, because it's, you will see it's not only uh, research which is happening there. Uh, the idea of this system is basically to, to, at the first stage, to save the lives. Because when we see that, what we see that after emergency, uh, very often the outbreaks of diseases happen and more people die because of that rather than of the emergency in the first place. So we are really dealing here with very hazardous material like um, feces coming from people which are having diarrhea. And these are condi conditions which are slightly different than conditions that we find in a normal sanitation, normal, which are, let's say, in a slum conditions or in a regular sanitation in urbanized uh, area, which are uh, sewered and well co uh, connected. Then we are also talking about a uh, transportation and optimizing the transport and the sludging. In Haiti only, in, in last, last earthquake, only in, few two m in the first two months, about half million euro was spent only on this sludging. So we are talking about lots of money in that business, and that whole system is far from optimal. And we are trying to incorporate technology which will optimize that system, which will put smartness on it, and which will, will in a very elegant way, provide the tools to, to the organizer to provide really efficient and cost-efficient sanitation. Now, moving to this, it's not idea that we read it, but it's just now uh, a list of conditions that emergency toilet needs to fulfill. And there are lots of conditions. There are more conditions than normal toilet. And I just highlighted some in the blue, which are conditions that we really ex ex exaggerated in our research, that we investigated, and that we at uh, uh, attach these uh, attributes or these facilities to the toilet facility. In our toilet idea, we are developing a new toilet. We call it smart ESOS toilets. We want to have a technologically sound product, accepted product, and the product which will give a hope to people. Some of you already mentioned this word hope. When people are in emergencies, they, they look for even small signs of hope. And we want that this toilet also gives a hope to people, that somebody take care about them and that is hope getting something which is they are not normally used to have. We also developed this toilet in a way that it's not that we're developing something for others, um, which are the p for people which are in trouble. I would like to use the toilet, that toilet that we are developing myself as well. You will see why. So we are. This is the the, the vision of that toilet. 
Um, it is uh, a full with the uh, electronics because we are now at the testing phase. It's full with the electronics features. Uh, we are having uh, four different uh, uh, material systems in it for urine, for feces, for service water, for wash water. We have a uh, uh, um, uh, power supply by, by uh, the uh, solar panels. We have uh, uh, safety buttons, uh, SOS buttons. Uh, it all communicates digitally with the, with the operator uh, through GSM and GPS uh, 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 system, which is uh, incorporated in it. But from outside, you don't see any of it. The idea of design was that you don't see it and you cannot steal anything from it or it's very difficult to de destroy it. We are at the developing it at two stages. First stage is experimental stage, where we are developing a toilet that Fiona will talk about that. And we are talking about design prototype, which is more or less a final product, which is in a shape of this toilet as you see it now. There are many uh, uh, novel features on it that I don't have time to go into it. There's also UV lamp, UV lamp in it to disinfect the area after person uses. There's also carbon filter which will uh, treat uh, 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 a smell or odor which is developing in a, in a treatment. There is a diversion of urine and, and the treatment in the toilet uh, and, and uh, many, many other uh, interesting features. <coughs> um, another feature which is not required by regular sanitation is that the toilet can be moved left and right, that can be transported, and that can fit in a European size pallet, which is 1 meter 20 by 0 0.8 meters. So our toilet is this. So you can unfold it and you could put it in together probably in about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, and you cannot make mistakes. It's just one way you can fit it. And uh, this is the, 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 the system uh, that we developed together with our partners. Uh, so everything falls apart together in one box and you can ship it, you can throw it from the plane <laughs> and still it will be, uh, it will survive and you can put it on the ground. Um, communication is very important. We will have ESOS operational center because in emergency there is already chaos and we are by non being very well organized just increasing that chaos by getting <laughs> facilities which we don't need facilities wi which we need but at the wrong place. We bring maybe facilities at the p place where the people are not there and not where the people are. Uh, we bring different uh, uh, facilities that don't fit to the local culture and so on. So there are many issues there and this system uh, is allowing uh, control and cost-effective operation of the system. Um, it will be managed locally. It can be managed from here, from Delft, from this laptop, but it can also be managed at the local uh, uh, site. Uh, through any kind of device, uh, laptop, iPad, uh, PC, and uh, given these electronic features, we can really trace, optimize the dislodging, optimize emptying, optimize the treatment, optimize the use. For example, if one of the tanks which are collecting feces or urine is filled, then the toilet will lock automatically, so you, you won't be able to use it unless, and immediately will get a signal, somebody will send some, uh, a truck to dislodge it in an organized way, and then the system uh, is operational again. And that all <laughs> can uh, be monitored here. Also, we will have a features to, to see how many men join the toilet, visit the toilet, how many women, how long they stay in the toilet, what they were really doing in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> all these features are there. It will allow us to understand what the, the mechanism of using a toilet in emergency situation. The really design tools now that relief agencies are doing, they say, 20 to 50 users per day. That's their design tool. But nobody really knows. Nobody really knows uh, who is using these toilets. Our kids are using, uh, elderly, uh, what, what age structure? Uh, is it only men or female? Um, our toilet will be acceptable. We'll have lights, we'll have uh, uh, sa safety features, and hopefully it will really um, yeah, be, be used by, by people in need. Um, on the background, you will have a statistics of all information. You'll have material flows. We can calculate how much nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, how much energy is there. Because these are, it's not waste. Urine and feces are not waste. They can be reused, they can be treated and reused, and so on. We can calculate how much heat is there that we can use. So you see, we are going beyond the box that of, of usual uh, emergency situations. 
And that's the beauty of this project where uh, we are allowed to, to go one step, um, not ahead, but one step aside from, let's say, re business as usual. Um, and this is okay if you have one toilet, but if you have a 200 or 300 toilets, what do you do then? You know, and then the real is the system and cost efficiency will come to the power. It's almost my last slide. So the, the toilet will have, it's the, the, the first toilet which, which is interchangeable. So we designed the toilet in a way that, that the pedestrian, so that the, the toilet seat can be <coughs> taken away, the whole thing, and then you end up with a squatting <laughs> pen. So depending on the culture, depending on, on, the, on the users, on the situation and the country, we can adjust to the local uh, conditions. <coughs> um, the, the feces and urine can be taken away, uh, they can be transported in a very safe way. What is happening in many emergencies, on the way to, uh, from the toilet to the disposal site, the truck is leaking and pathogens are leaking. Cholera, diarrhea, microorganisms are spread easily and more and more people get affected. In this system, everything is contained and user cannot get in touch with, uh, with any of these uh, uh, flows. The, the planning, uh, where we are now, we are at the moment, we just finished last night, thanks to our, our colleagues, the design. So these are really the last uh, 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 pictures from the toilet. Uh, we are planning to, uh, we are at the moment building experimental setup that Fiona will explain, and we are expecting to, to, to finish the experimental part, so the, the field application of, of, of the toilet uh, this year, and to uh, uh, build uh, the, 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 the prototype in real size uh, by the end of the year. We also want to make uh, the, the, the commercialization of this uh, product. We need the players to be on board, the, the relief agencies uh, and so on. We are already involving them, but we are expecting also to have a, uh, the advisory group uh, from practice, like with Red Cross, UNHCR, uh, Oxfam, uh, Doctors Without Borders and so on and to get uh, uh, really things at, um, as, as soon as possible uh, available for commercial applications. And that really depends on, on funding. But already there are some interest of funding agency to, to buy a number of these toilets. But we have to first to prove the, the concept and is it working really in the field and how it works. And that, that we have all believe and trust that it will be all fine uh, and that we get all these results this year. We can put these toilets together and get the batteries like this, so to have more communal type of sanitation. And we want really to provide a good condition for people, at least to have a good, decent place, to have some privacy and to do pee and poo in a few minutes <laughs> and to come back to, to, the, to the life, um, you know, at least to give some hope and some dignity. And this system, I, we believe, provides such things. And my last slide before introducing uh, Fiona is how I see how uh, inventions come to innovation. Invention uh, become innovation only when it's applied. So for me, there are four major drivers and conditions from my own experience. First, you have to think, think outside of the box. And that many of us are really much focused in our small businesses and our small shops. You have to go out to, to hear stories like we heard today which are really enlightening. Then you have to really change the paradigm, change con uh, the, the conventional way of thinking. If we did it like that for the last 20 years, why we should continue? We have to have a good reasons to continue or not co to continue. Third reason is see a little bit more than just the tree in front of you. See the whole forest. So go a little bit like this or a little bit like that or under or up. Find what is happening behind it. Um, so it's about the focus. And the last but not the least, you need to have a guts. There is, must be somebody, some launching customer, who will find the idea good and say, hey, we are the first one who will apply it. And we need this. This is, in the chain of innovation, the most critical part. And we are soon at that stage to find somebody uh, who will first apply it on the real scale, big time. It's not that we are calling emergencies to happen, but they will happen, and we know that. And we know that there, there is a big market for that, but we have to, to bring something new to the market and this system is, to our opinion, really bringing um, new stuff to the market from 
the perspective of management, but also from the perspective of technologies. Um, I would like now to ask my uh, colleague and uh, PhD student, Fiona, to show you what she will do or what she is doing uh, on that topic. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, all right. I'm going to take the last of this slide uh, to, to be remembered for the entire presentation. No guts, no glory. OK, remember that, because the next slide would be about that. OK, have you heard enough about toilet? No? This is not toilets that I'm showing you. Um, this is a picture of um, emergency water treatment in an exhibition in German. Um, you know, German engineers is a fully gutted hardcore engineers, right? So this complicated system, see, seemingly like complicated system is to treat water for emergency use. Then, the question was asked to these uh, hardcore engineers. What do you do in emergency for wastewater treatment for sanitation? And our answer, um, this is the, the very expert engineers, the German. They will say, um, well, basically nothing. We just dig the hole and then, yeah, do the business there and then close the business, close the hole. That's it. So if you think that the ESOS toilet were complicated, well, um, you have to wait until the last of my story then. Now, reality check. We, we don't just do research based on like concept that we think will work. We also reflect it in the current situation. So this is, um, I'm taking a picture from very recent emergency program, uh, emergency uh, event, uh, it's a uh, folk volcanic eruption in Indonesia just a few weeks ago. Uh, the, it's called Mount Sinabung. And this is uh, how they were evacuated. Still, it's women and children that suffered the most. And this is uh, how it's done. The ashes were basically covered the entire location, so people have to move. People have to be displaced. Then a colleague of ours, also in the team of emergency sanitation uh, research, uh, the one that is based in Indonesia, uh, her name is York. Uh, he visited the place and uh, as part of he, her research, he then looked at the emergency sanitation response there. As you can see in the picture here, the first uh, column here is the immediate phase. And it's, uh, there's like a variety of technology that this is basically just also only the hole with some kind of uh, wooden flooring. This similarly with this. And this one, although it looks like uh, much better, but it's basically not emergency toilet. It's only like they, they were using the current facilities in the mosque. So, um, Obviously, it's overloaded with the high number of displaced people. Then the stabilization phase, meaning like probably like few weeks after the uh, aftermath of the disaster, people will come to help and then building some structures like this for toilets. The the third uh, last column here. There are like a number of design, a number of uh, <laughs> but similar thing. You can see that like uh, the drainage is not well taken care of. Even this one, although it looks clean, actually it, it's locked. So people doesn't have access to the toilet. It's not for the evacuees. It's not for the displaced people. It's more probably to the provider or probably the relief workers. Okay, then I have to go back to the, uh, the topic of today, the women. <coughs> so, 
So, um, uh, as you probably already aware that uh, wash, uh, meaning not only washing, not, uh, washing clothes like the, what the women is doing, uh, it's also stand f uh, the acronym that stands for water, sanitation, and hygiene. So sanitation is part of the uh, bigger story here. Then um, I think the previous speakers has already told you about how the women in emergencies and a lot of other stories about how how uh, their life is. But um, I want to tell you the story from the pictures. I took this picture myself, so I think when talking about emergency wash, uh, women and children are central. And this is what I observe in the field. Whenever I visited the water point where they collect uh, water, it's, I always see women and children. No men sometimes. I don't know where the hell they are. So, <laughs> so um, <coughs> similarly, you see it's all women with all the colorful uh, clothing there. But then there was other women that is also in emergency. And that was me. So, um, yeah, um, uh, this is the pictures that I took uh, in Sudan, in Darfur, uh, in 2010. I was uh, being a wash engineer. I am usually the only women surrounded by this man engineer. So. But then, the story about women emergency is not about, uh, I think it was mentioned, it's not about that women is labeled with vulnerability. It's not about that. It's not about sad stories. It's not about tears. It's not about suffering. It's not about the drama out of it. It's not about that. I think when talking about women emergency, it's about strength. It's about surviving. They survived the disaster, but then they have to survive another life in the displacement camp. And then I come to this story. I meet these uh, two girls, they are sisters, and um, they just arrived in this uh, camp. It's not a camp, but they just uh, built like a makeshift tent to as a hut, as a shelter. And then um, there was like I was there to to ask for latrines construction, and they were the one who does it, not the men. So with very uh, very simple tools, they have to dig um, pit for two meters. This is what uh, they did, and um, it's a rocky soil, so it's very hard. It's very hard to dig with very simple tools. It takes probably six days to dig about two meters, and it, I, I, I was so I was surprised that a girl like that can can do that. So, for me, actually, it's not necessary. You can actually probably provide better response in in emergency. And then, after all the hard work, this is the result. It's a latrine, just like that. You cannot see the hole anymore because of the structure, but you see the hole, it's, uh, the, the wall, the surrounded wall is, uh, is very low. Like, um, for me, sanitation is dignity, right? For me, this is not the sanitation with dignity. So, I, I, have, I have a hard time when working in the field that I don't have a place to go for the trains. And then I was asking myself, okay, what's the difference between me and these women in the displacement? They're all women. So if I don't want to use these trains, they probably will not use it as well. But they use it anyway because that's the best they can do. So 
So this is my dream. This is what I'm trying to make, sanitation with dignity. It might seem complicated, but it's doable. That's why to reach this point, it's still far, it's a long journey. I know, I'm, I'm being realistic here. I've been in the field. But then, uh, thanks to our designers, we come up with the idea to build an experimental model, which is like um, a much a simpler uh, structure, but still have all the features that we want. And we want to pilot it in the field. And so this is what I'm going to do what I'm going to do this year in the experimental testing. So um, we plan it very carefully uh, with, uh, as I said, with all the features that we want to be built in the fusion design. And then um, as you can see in the slide, there is like a separation of tanks with feces and urine. And also um, we make sure that it's easy to be taken out for emptying. So we, we do take care about the maintenance. And we take care about all uh, the details here. Uh, and we also have like um, features like uh, the tank for water supply, um, other things. I cannot, um, I cannot mention it one by one, but we do, we do check for the structural strength uh, the weighing, the bending, and everything. I will just uh, go forward. And this is my plan. Now, um, we are now at the uh, phase to build it, manufacturing the prototype. Uh, we hope that it would be ready to be tested in May, uh, end of May. And then I will go to the field uh, location is yet to be determined, so if any of uh, any of you can be uh, a resource for me to access the real emergency camp, that would be welcome. So, um, I have been questioned in the, in some presentation. Some people say, "Okay, uh, your research is not PhD research because it's not scientific enough. It's too practical." But I'm going to say this is quite scientific. Although it's about shit, it's still scientific. <laughs> okay, so um, what, what I want to do in the field testing is that I want to, um, one of it, I, I get nine objectives, uh, uh, so I will just tell you some of it. So um, uh, first, uh, the most important thing is the characterization of the feces and urine, as uh, my professor already explained some to you. So this is, will be useful for us to give feedbacks to the design vision toilet to finalize it at the end. And um, we want to optimize some of the features well, like the, the dimension of the tank. So information like, okay, uh, do you urinate more often than defecation and the volume of your urine, the volume of your feces would be very useful in this case. So you see, it's very scientific, right? <laughs> And um, I, I would like to test also some of the pictures, like the UV light. I, I'm, I'm looking at my colleagues from the water science engineering and those people doing the water treatment. They do UV light for water treatment, but I'm going hardcore. I'm going to use it for, uh, it's not for the pieces, it's for the surface of the toilet. And um, I would like also to check all the sensor equipment, and we're going to use some some new, newly found technology like uh, nano coating uh, for like anti stick. And not only technical, I would like to know about the user acceptance as well. How how the uh, refugees, how the internally displaced people would would see it? How would would they use it? Would be would they be happy with it? and then also the social behavior. And then, uh, this is my uh, closing remarks. I believe that this is, um, if I'm successful, I hope uh, this can be applied widely 
it can be used for other uh, other case and emergency. It can be used uh, in slum, informal settlement with minor modification. It can be used for like outdoor public <laughs> events because I would like to use that toilet. So it's like everybody would like to use it then. And I believe if this is successful again, this approach will contribute to a better sanitation response, more than just a pit. With that, I shall you know. Thank you very much for the presentation. I didn't get to know before that shit is really serious business. <laughs> uh, thanks for enlightening us. Now, time is far much spent, and uh, we will only allow two questions, actually. Uh, two questions only. So, maybe for the previous speaker. Yeah. For both the previous speaker and uh, this presentation. Okay. Thank you very much for both, for the nice presentation. And I want to ask many questions, but this is a real photo or not? No, it's not. Now, the, the toilets are not real, but the rest is real. <laughs> okay. Because I think, I think uh, it's a very good idea, but this toilet is not an emergency toilet, this is a seasonal toilet. Or maybe for if we have a big party or something, we can use it. But in case our, our refugee camp, this toilet, is, I think, is very hard. Because we should know that which country we use, how much water they need, and what's the resource of water. Most of refugee camps, we have we have problem for resource of water. And <coughs> they use a toilet or toilet place for showering also. I was in, the, um, in many camps and I know the behavior. Even by myself, I cannot use toilet there. So, th this is a very good idea. And I have a question here. But, uh, how many persons need to fill this time? <laughs> right, uh, uh, um, just to come back to, to your first comment, uh, we are, um, um, of course, it's one solution doesn't fit the whole world, you know. But um, we are accommodating uh, facilities for, for example, if there is a rain, uh, the roof acts as a rainwater harvesting area. So all roof, all water which falls on the roof, even a condense which is in the night created, like in deserts, will go into the tank. So that that's what. Then, if you have a water supply, some water supply, you can attach water supply to it. And if you have a supply with the vendors, you can also supply it manually, or even if you hatch water somewhere in the river, you can bring it there and drop it. So all options are there. Now, um, your, your second question was? Uh, size. The size, yes. So um, we have uh, standards, which are regular sanitation standards that a person per day, uh, one person, not one visitor, but one person per day you, uh, dis discharges about one and a half liter of urine and about 150 gram of feces. Now, uh, it doesn't say that the, 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 the same person will visit this toilet three times a day, but uh, we plan, we, we calculate per, uh, per user about half liter of, of uh, per use, half liter of urine, and about 150 gram of feces. Then we design the, the, the sizes of the toilets that, that the, 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 the feces collection is about 80 to 100 kilograms which can accommodate about uh, uh, 80, 80 users or, or more. And then uh, the, the urine tank is about uh, 100, 150 liters. That's, these are the, 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 the volumes that we are talking about. So it can survive for about three or four days, I think, uh, with the frequent use without uh, being emptied. And uh, the energy supply can last for uh, about a week. So it can work in the darkness for for one week. And the final step for uh, this uh, sewage water, what will we do? Well, the final one. So in very short. In, so in refugee camp. In the refugee camp. So Not the in Europe. 
you remember Ger you remember G German German slide? No, this no. German slide is just uh, <laughs> the, but the real life is different. The real life. So we are designing now the the, the mobile containerized uh, uh, unit, uh, which will uh, be a treatment which will contain several treatment steps. In one, you we will treat uh, the feces, and in the separate one, we will treat urine, and at some point, we will treat some. Uh, things together as well. So that will be a containerized unit that you can move even by four men from uh, one place to another. So you can either uh, bring all excreta to a centralized uh, treatment or if you have uh, 400,000 people in a, in a camp, you can move your treatment to the source and treat the, the feces at the spot. And we are, uh, uh, we need about we are now in the stage where we are uh, finalizing the concept and very soon we will uh, build the, the prototype. Also, by the end of the year, we'll have a prototype that we planned with uh, my student, uh, Peter Mavio. Uh, we will test it in uh, Nairobi, uh, in a slum of uh, Kibera, the, the whole system, including the toilets as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. The last one. Hello, you're right, yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, my yeah. name is Sandra Mechens. Yeah. I am a water expert, but I am also external advisor to a Minister of Risk Reduction in Ecuador. Uh, we are hosting a very a large event in May for 600 people, all expert in uh, risk reduction of disaster. Uh, we are a donor country, Haiti, uh, Philippines, and Syria. I find very interesting this presentation because we are truly believe that business has to be continued after a disaster. And also we are looking for experience with the uh, possibility alliance between public and private organizations. So I uh, made sure that this presentation will come to my minister and uh, the rest I guess also you have to make a little more uh, lobby about what is the result and the benefit of his uh, experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. You can use the mic. Sorry, but I have to speak now on behalf of UNHCR because Diane had to fetch her plane. You're both invited to come to Geneva and discuss with the sanitation people of UNHCR to see whether they can help you with the testing. Thanks. I see good things are coming out of <laughs> the discussion. Uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, every good thing has to come to an end, unfortunately. And uh, at this point, I would like to welcome Laura from the communication for the closing remarks. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, this brings us to the end of our program. Uh, I want to thank the entire audience for their attention. I especially want to thank the people who on social media have spread the word to the people who couldn't make it here. Um, I have a very special thanks to give to all the speakers, and I would like to ask um, uh, you guys to help me to give the books. I have some presents for them, please. If all the, all the speakers could come on stage, the ones that are still left. We're not done yet. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> not yet.
final things. Um, I would also like to invite the moderators on stage because I have a little something for you as well. Uh, we've been talking about disaster uh, risk reduction, so I have something to reduce the risk of disasters that often happen in the Netherlands. We do have them here. Please. Thank you very much for helping out. You did an excellent, excellent job, both of you. The two, yeah. And for my final thanks, it's a big one. Uh, I would like to ask the help of our rector, Andras. Well, although Damir has declared that he is the only man in the audience, <laughs> at least those who were talking here, I would like to close this meeting like a man should do by thanking that person who was really the engine behind that uh, and brought the speakers and uh, made an extremely interesting program, and that is my dear colleague, Kreit Fink, and I would like to present her with this table flower. <laughs> Deze draag mee.